Welcome to the Bash Shell Scripting Guide. In this lesson, we will introduce you to the shell and explain the purpose of shell. We will also look at different other types of shell and what is their use. So first, the definition of shell. A shell is a command line utilities which interacts with the kernel on user's behalf. It interprets the message which users enters from the console or terminal. So it's basically kind of an interpreter because a kernel can understand a message in certain format. Kernel has a well-defined interface to interact with it due to security. For example, a kernel cannot understand most of the stuff except for the calls through system call. So which means a user which wants to interact with the kernel has to write a system call which is not possible all the time. So what a shell does is take the input from the user, massage the input, make it in such a way that the kernel can understand and call the necessary system call on behalf of the user and get the message back from the kernel and present it to the user. So shell is nothing but a command line interpreter. There are different types of shell and we will look into mostly bash shell because it's the most predominantly used one. There are other type of shell like C shell, con shell, TCSH, ASH. We will go through each of them. So on the broader way, there are two categories in which all the shell lies. One is C shell categories and one is a bond shell. C shell categories, the shell which lies are C shell itself and the TCSH. The name C shell has been given because when it was written, it was written in such a way that it understands some of the C type syntax. C type, not exactly, it's not a C language, but C type syntax. Bond shell is a native shell which was written first and then there was an extension to that which is a bash and then there are other shell like con shell and pdsh which are kind of similar but not same in this lecture and video in the entire video series we will be learning only bash shell most of the things which you learn will be applicable to con pdsh bond all kinds of shells they are almost similar but there are still some differences but C shell is very different. So whatever you learn will not be applicable to shell, C shell, but for all other shells, it would be almost similar and probably you can say 80, for 80 to 85 percent of the things matches between all these shells. So what is, there are other things which users, which shell can do. For example, shell can interpret the input and present it in a way so that kernel can understand so what i mean by this statement is like this so for this exercise for this entire tutorial we will be using ubuntu and i will be doing hands-on on ubuntu i'm using ubuntu as my virtual machine this is my ubuntu machine and we will learn everything practical on ubuntu it will be same for CentOS or maybe Mint or Kali Linux, whatever you want to use. But Ubuntu is amongst the best in terms of desktop applications, ease of use. So we will go for Ubuntu. So let me tell you what I meant exactly by it interprets users commands. So there is one command called echo and echo means whatever you write, it will just echo back onto the screen. Simple, something like printf in any other language, printf or println. So I said echo hello world and it just printed hello world. It's just echo. Now, if I say echo star, let's see what it gives. You see, when I say echo star, it says desktop. It's not giving me star because there is one folder called desktop here in my present working directory and that's what it is showing. Now let's suppose if I go to some other directory and I say echo star, what it gives. 
it lists out all the files and folders present in this directory something if you are familiar with ls something what ls command does so it seems like echo star is interpreting what is a star now let's suppose if i just want to echo itself i can have it as a string literal and then it will echo just the star there is a difference between double quote and single quote we will learn through all of these so now here also the double quotes it will say star but still there is a difference between these and this in terms of variable expansions we will go through all of this in some of the um, later chapters but what i wanted to show you is about the interpretation so what is happening exactly is when you say star star is treated as a wild card so wild card means it will try to grab all the files and folders in the particular folder where you have executed the command and it tries to see okay what are all the things present in that folder that's the way it does the command substitution and that's why it is giving if you just say star it's a, but if you say echo j some character it will say j because j doesn't falls under some kind of wild card that is exactly what i meant by interpretation so whatever you type may not be exactly whatever it is presented to the kernel there is something else which is presented to the kernel so this shell scripting would be applicable to almost all kind of posix compliant os by posix i mean to say like mac os x if you are using the terminal of mac os x you can use bash shell scripting you can use in freebsd and of course on linux in Linux, you can do it in different kinds of flavors like Ubuntu, CentOS, Fedora, Mint, Kali Linux, and whatnot, whatever flavor. Almost all of them has the Bash shell. And in Windows 10, nowadays they're coming with in uh, with Bash shell as well. So you can use Windows 10 also to do some of the exercise. Although I cannot comment exactly how complete they are, but you can give it a try now what is the shell which you will be using now since there are she shell bash shell ash com shell so how do a user know which shell he will be using that is something which is being set by the administrator when he creates your user account so when a user account is being created that account entry goes into a file called etc password and in that etc password there is the last field this field signifies what kind of shell you want to use if instead of bin bash if i would have said slash bin slash ash it should have taken ash shell or maybe sh which is born shell bash is born again shell and the first shell was sh which is born shell so this way we can change the shell enter there are other fields which i will explain in details in some other lectures as and when we come across all these things but this is just a starting and i would like to give you some introduction for this shell the other easy way is finding out your shell is you go to your terminal and say echo dollar shell we will go through the meaning of dollar and how to do variable expansion what is a variable everything so if you say echo dollar shell it will tell you the kind of shell it is let's suppose if you were in ash shell or sh it would have given you something like bin sh or bin ksh for k shell now how does the shell looks like in terms of hardware and kernel so this is the way it is so hardware is at the very bottom and then on top of hardware we have a kernel which controls the hardware and resources the kernel has entry points if you want to enter into the kernel talk to the kernel you have to go through system calls system call are absolutely must to interact with the kernel a kernel cannot understand anything anything and absolutely anything except for system call at least this is the way linux works and then shell interacts with the kernel using system call so remember i said like okay it's an interpreter so let's suppose take an example for echo star so what does the shell does shell does says okay i want to expand all the names with respect to the files present in the current directory so what echo might be doing in that terms is 
take the current directory and recursively tries to find out how many files are present the way to find out all the files which are present in a particular directory it must be doing dir entry kind of system call to the linux kernel getting all the response back to the shell and then showing me all the files and folders one at a time and then of course you can have your own custom applications which can talk to the system call and in terms interact with the kernel and probably can interact with the hardware and this is the user you sitting on top of that running applications using system calls contacting kernel and same way user using shell script and running so this is the way shell script works now shell script is just an interpreter so let us also go through what is the kernel kernel is the heart of operating system in case of ubuntu fedora and this kind of os it manages the resources like cpu memory disk for windows also it does the same but the kernel functionality like in terms of device driver file system the way everything is a file in linux is not the same in windows so we will not go into those kind of details but just an introduction so kernel is something which manages all, all your hardware manages all your hardware resources and when we say resources the resources are mostly like cpu memory disk and io now in contracts shell just interacts with the kernel and give the work to the kernel and it is the kernel which does all the work and gives the output back so if you look at the diagram how does the shell and different kinds of utilities in the system looks like it would be like this so hardware is at the very core of the kernel it means it's not a part of a kernel but in this diagram it is at the very core at the heart on top of that is a kernel kernel protects the hardware which means kernel is the one which will be using the hardware it will not allow a user applications to interact with the hardware directly and on top of that there are different kinds of applications or utilities or maybe there is a shell here it is sh which is a bomb shell it could have been bash shell and then there can be other applications which can be directly contacting to the kernel through system call or these applications might interact through the bash shell and in turns goes to the kernel when i say directly right now it is possible but the way typical applications run all the applications you open a terminal and run in a terminal now when you open a terminal it's a bash shell so that's why these other applications goes to the shell only it cannot go directly but it is even though possible that without any terminal you can run it but it might not be that interesting we will learn all these concepts in the upcoming videos and i will also tell you what all the different kinds of commands utilities and the scripting we will be doing in my next video thank you for watching welcome to the bash shell scripting guide in this lesson we will introduce you the shell and explain the purpose of shell we will also look at different other types of shell and what is their use so first the definition of shell a shell is a command line utilities which interacts with the kernel on users behalf it interprets the message which users enters from the console or terminal so it's basically kind of a interpreter because a kernel can understand a message in certain format kernel has a well defined interface to interact with it due to security for example a kernel cannot understand most of the stuff except for the calls through system call so which means a user which wants to interact with the kernel has to write a system call which is not possible all the time so what a shell does is take the input from the user massage the input make it in such a way that the kernel can understand and call the necessary system call on behalf of the user and get the message back from the kernel and present it to the user so shell is nothing but a 
command line interpreter there are different types of shell and we will look into mostly bash shell because it's the most predominantly used one there are other type of shell like c shell con shell tcsh ash we will go through each of them so on the broader way there are two categories in which all the shell lies one is c shell categories and one is a bond shell c shell categories the shell which lies are c shell itself and the tcsh the name c shell has been given because when it was written it was written in such a way that it understands some of the c type syntax c type not exactly it's not a c language but c type syntax bond shell is a native shell which was written first and then there was an extension to that which is a bash and then there are other shell like con shell and pdsh which are kind of similar but not same in this lecture and video in the entire video series we will be learning only bash shell most of the things which you learn will be applicable to con pdsh bon all kinds of shells they are almost similar but there are still some differences but c shell is very different so whatever you learn will not be applicable to shell c shell but for all other shells it would be almost similar and probably you can say 84 80 to 85% of the things matches between all these shells so what is there are other things which uses which shell can do for example shell can interpret the input and present it in a way so that kernel can understand so what i mean by this statement is like this so for this exercise for this entire tutorial we will be using ubuntu and i will be doing hands on on ubuntu i am using ubuntu as my virtual machine this is my ubuntu machine and we will learn everything practical on ubuntu it will be same for centos or maybe mint or kali linux whatever you want to use but ubuntu is amongst the best in terms of desktop applications ease of use so we will go for ubuntu so let me tell you what i meant exactly by it interprets users commands so this is one command called echo and echo means whatever you write it will just echo back onto the screen simple something like printf in any other language printf or println so i said echo hello world and it just printed hello world it's just echo now if i say echo star let's see what it gives you see when i say echo star it says desktop it's not giving me star because there is one folder called desktop here in my present working directory and that's what it is showing now let's suppose if i go to some other directory and i say echo star what it gives it lists out all the files and folders present in this directory something if you are familiar with ls something what ls command does so it seems like echo star is interpreting what is a star now let's suppose if i just want to echo itself i can have it as a string literal and then it will echo just the star there is a difference between double quote and single quote we will learn through all of these so now here also the double quotes it will say star but still there is a difference between these and this in terms of variable expansions we will go through all of this in some of the um, later chapters but what i wanted to show you is about the interpretation so what is happening exactly is when you say star star is treated as a wild card so wild card means it will try to grab all the files and folders in the particular folder where you have executed the command and it tries to see okay what are all the things present in that folder that's the way it does the command substitution and that's why it is giving if you just say star it's a but if you say echo j some character it will say j because j doesn't falls under some kind of wild card that is exactly what i meant by interpretation so whatever you type may not be exactly whatever it is presented to the kernel there is something else which is presented to the kernel 
so this shell scripting would be applicable to almost all kind of POS6 compliant OS by POS6 I mean to say like Mac OS X if you are using the terminal of Mac OS X you can use bash shell scripting you can use in FreeBSD and of course on Linux in Linux you can do it in different kinds of flavors like Ubuntu, CentOS, Fedora, Mint, Kali Linux and what not whatever flavor almost all of them has the bash shell and in Windows 10 nowadays they're coming with in uh, with bash shell as well so you can use Windows 10 also to do some of the exercise although I cannot comment exactly how complete they are but you can give it a try now what is the shell which you will be using now since there are she shell bash shell ash con shell so how do a user know which shell he will be using that is something which is being set by the administrator when he creates your user account so when a user account is being created that account entry goes into a file called etc password and in that etc password there is a last field this field signifies what kind of shell you want to use if instead of bin bash if I would have said slash bin slash ash it should have taken ash shell or maybe sh which is born shell bash is born again shell and the first shell was sh which is born shell so this way we can change the shell enter there are other fields which i will explain in details in some other lectures as and when we come across all these things but this is just a starting and i would like to give you some introduction for this shell the other easy way is finding out your shell is you go to your terminal and say echo dollar shell we will go through the meaning of dollar and how to do variable expansion what is a variable everything so if you say echo dollar shell it will tell you the kind of shell it is let's suppose if you were in ash shell or sh it would have given you something like bin sh or bin ksh for k shell now how does the shell looks like in terms of hardware and kernel so this is the way it is so hardware is at the very bottom and then on top of hardware we have a kernel which controls the hardware and resources the kernel has entry points if you want to enter into the kernel talk to the kernel you have to go through system call system call are absolutely must to interact with the kernel a kernel cannot understand anything anything and absolutely anything except for system call at least this is the way Linux works and then shell interacts with the kernel using system call so remember I said like okay it's an interpreter so let's suppose take an example for echo star so what does the shell does shell does says okay I want to expand all the names with respect to the files present in the current directory so what echo might be doing in that terms is take the current directory and recursively tries to find out how many files are present the way to find out all the files which are present in a particular directory it must be doing dir entry kind of system call to the linux kernel getting all the response back to the shell and then showing you all the files and folders one at a time and then of course you can have your own custom applications which can talk to the system call and in terms interact with the kernel and probably can interact with the hardware and this is the user you sitting on top of that running applications using system calls contacting kernel and same way user using shell script and running so this is the way shell script works now shell script is just an interpreter so let us also go through what is the kernel kernel is the heart of operating system in case of Ubuntu, Fedora and this kind of OS it manages the resources like CPU, memory, disk for Windows also it does the same but the kernel functionality like in terms of device driver, file system the way everything is a file in Linux is not the same in Windows so we will not go into those kind of details but just an introduction so kernel is something which manages all, all your hardware manages all your hardware resources and when we say resources 
the resources are mostly like cpu memory disk and io now in contracts shell just interacts with the kernel and give the work to the kernel and it is the kernel which does all the work and gives the output back so if you look at the diagram how does the shell and different kinds of utilities in the system looks like it would be like this so hardware is at the very core of the kernel it means it's not a part of a kernel but in this diagram it is at the very core at the heart on top of that is a kernel kernel protects the hardware which means kernel is the one which will be using the hardware it will not allow a user applications to interact with the hardware directly and on top of that there are different kinds of applications or utilities or maybe there is a shell here it is sh which is a bomb shell it could have been bash shell and then there can be other applications which can be directly contacting to the kernel through system call or these applications might interact through the bash shell and in turns goes to the kernel when i say directly right now it is possible but the way typical applications run all the applications you open a terminal and run in a terminal now when you open a terminal it's a bash shell so that's why this other applications goes to the shell only it cannot go directly but it is even though possible that without any terminal you can run it but it might not be that interesting we will learn all these concepts in the upcoming videos and i will also tell you what all the different kinds of commands utilities and the scripting we will be doing in my next video thank you for watching hello and welcome friend in this tutorial we will try to look at how to run a bash shell script in mac so by default in mac os x you will always get a terminal and if you guys are aware of that mac os x is based out of free bsd kernel and some parts out of bsd kernel so they are more like a unix and linux rather than windows so they have taken the kernel from FreeBSD on top of that they have put a UI layer and they have created this entire operating system so that's why Mac OS X was POSIX compliant long before Windows so the way to run a bash shell scripting any bash is you go to the launch pad and by default you will get this icon terminal you will not have this item we will come to this later on but you will get the terminal and you can open the terminal and start typing this is giving you the shell and when you go to the terminal you have different options of selecting the profile like you can select whatever theme you want to choose and if you want to make something as permanent as default you can go to the terminal and preferences choose whatever you want to use and set it as default and next time when you open the terminal that default one will open up for you so I have chosen this now this is my default that's the way it, it works now let's quickly run through some of the commands so if we are uh, wanted to be familiar that okay this is actually working so let's see if I say echo dollar shell you see it will tell me the bash bin bash and if you go and do it similarly on the Linux so I have another win machine as Ubuntu machine this is my Linux and if I say echo dollar shell it will tell me exactly the same thing so that means by default the terminal which you fire up in Mac OS and the terminal in Linux they both run bash so they are both supporting bash both operating systems are supporting bash and in the terminal the shell which is running by default is a bash shell so all the scripts and everything in bash will work exactly like same now where the difference would come the difference would come with respect to some of the commands which I will list you right now now before going any further and I wanted to show you a side to side picture between Linux and Windows so I wanted to suggest you something more than this so terminal is good this terminal is good for many of the work but I find it little hard in terms of splitting the screen like if you say control D or Apple command and D it will is split it horizontally rather than vertically that's what I want and I at least I don't find any features to split vertically 
and then copy and paste is not so good as compared to item so there is another project mac os project which uh, in which you have you can download item 2 now i feel that item 2 is much better advanced more customizable than the default terminal which it comes <laughs> so you might give it a try you can download and just install this so i already have it installed in my system here and i will use this and don't worry about black and white you can choose any trim by going to the item preferences and you can go appearance windows whatever arrangements you can choose any of the themes keys advanced options so you can do many of the customizations here so it has lot of customizations you can choose color and customize here color presets whatever you want to do i don't want to change it now but uh, if you want you can do something like this so this looks better for me with light background so let's keep it like this and i will increase the font for now okay so now this is my terminal and on this machine this is my mac i am also running a virtual machine for linux and if i wanted to show you it's here so i have two virtual machines and one is this linux and windows we don't care for now so let's not talk about that and this is my mac. so what i will do is i will open one more terminal i split it by apple and d so which is apple command and d and i increase this in this terminal i will on the right hand side i will open i will remote login ssh we will come and look into these commands later on so on the right hand side i did a ssh to my linux ubuntu machine and on the left hand side this is my machine which is mac now if i run the command uname minus a on my linux machine which is a ubuntu machine you see this is a i686 386 machines it's a basically a 32 bit linux machine ubuntu and on the left hand side if i run on the mac you see that it says the kernel as darwin so mac os kernel they named it as darwin which is a derivative of freebsd and you have some of the versions and everything else but if you run the same unim command on ubuntu or any other linux based distributions you will see it as linux rather than darwin so those are the small differences you will see some little bit but in terms of general bash syntax like for loop if loop conditional statements and case statements everything will remain the same so whatever is di dictated by POSIX POSIX is a set of compliant standard for this kind of things so both bash from the mac os x and linux and maybe some other unix whatever is POSIX compliant they will all follow the same standard now someone might try to add extra feature which is apart from POSIX but at least the basic POSIX part if you are using the POSIX part of bash shell script it will work irrespective of mac os x or linux now let's try to run a small test script on both linux and mac just for demo let's see this Oh, there is already something here but uh, let me just clean it up i will not go for this advanced topic so i'll just write one small for loop so i'll say while true this means always true then do we will go through all this syntax later on and i say echo hello and i don't want to have a very tight loop so i will say sleep and done and let me run this script now if i run this script and first let me copy the same script to my ubuntu also so that i can run the same script exactly at both the places so we are test dot si ch mode with ch mode i am giving all the permissions so ch mode will change the permissions so i say sudo okay and i run this script so every one second it will print hello this is linux on the right hand side and then same thing i have to run on mac os i don't have the uh, mode set so i could either say bash dot slash test dot sh or i can say ch mode 777 or u plus x and i would say test.sh 
and now if I run dot slash test dot sh in my current path they both run so you see the same script is running on left hand side which is my Mac and on the right hand side which is on Linux so basically you can say this comes as very handy that you don't have to do anything extra to run a bash shell scripting in Mac everything comes already installed all the utilities and everything now let's look at some of the smaller differences now mind it the differences which i am mentioning is not with respect to bash but it might be helpful for you to understand when you are coding some scripts which require some commands so let me tell you one example let's see there is a command called hostname which will give you the host name of the system basically a name not the ip address fine it works on mac let's try to run on linux it works on linux very good now if you go and say the man hostname on linux if you see there is an option called minus i which will give you all ip address okay so this will list out the ip address let's try to do this this in on linux you see it give me the ip address if i want to get the ip address i could have done i if config also and it would have given me the exact same ip address but with hostname also you can get ip address on linux now having understand that let's try to do the hostname dash i on mac what it says i is an illegal option so you have to see some of these commands between linux and mac they might have a different options or no options or the command might behave differently so it's about command it's not exactly about bash bash is command plus the bash script and the bash looping conditional statements everything club together so you have to be careful about this you could also say man hostname if the man page is already there you can see what are the options they have so they don't have much options in mac maybe it's not needed okay so that's one example now let's suppose i wanted to see how many disk i have in my system so let's go to the finder and see i have only one extra disk which is my samsung of course i have the defa default mac disk that's there but this is my extra disk which i have put in my system so there is this command called disk util so if you say disk util and run just that you will see a lot of options you have to choose one of the options there are a lot of options be careful not to run options like resize partition or zero disk some of them might corrupt your disk so you have to be careful what you are doing or you understand what you are doing so let's suppose with this util if i say list it will list me let me make it little smaller so that it's easy to visualize in one single screen okay clear will clear clean the clear the current screen so that we can go to the top and look freshly so i say disk util and list now you see here maybe i wanted to make it little more smaller sorry let's make it little more smaller and this screen bigger okay so if you see here disk utils it will tell me that i have basically three disks now let's look through that and what does it says so dev disk zero one internal disk that's mean I, I cannot pull it out directly without opening my macbook chassis macbook backside and then this is 500 gb size and this is a good partition and you see that it says that out of this disk zero two partitions are created one is 314 mb and the other is 500 gb so the, the way partition is created in mac is dev disk zero and then s1 s2 so disk zero s1 s2 this is part of this now if you see the another one disk one synthesized this says that i have 500 gb disk one and then i have some pre-installed mac pre-boot recovery and all those things so what happens is exactly they have created a disk one out of the existing disk zero and they have put a pre-installed mac os s and the way to understand this is uh, let's suppose in linux if you are trying to format a disk you will format the disk and when you want to install you have to install freshly from the iso or someplace on the dvd cd whatever you can do a pixie boot in linux also uh, but to do the pixie boot you have to set up the pixie boot in mac 
over the network it's not exactly pixie boot when you want to reinstall your operating system over the network you can reinstall because you have already some pre image stored into the device so they have some of the pre image recovery everything already created by default so let's not worry much about that then the second this is the interesting part this is my external drive this is my samsung drive which i have created and put it's a usb device and this is again 500 gb disk and out of that disk 2 it has created partition disk s1 now this is disk util now let's suppose i wanted to run the same command in linux will it work disk util there is no disk util so how do i run in linux so in linux there is this command called fdisk and in fdisk it will tell you dev sta you can say f sta minus l so i'll have to run with a sudo of course sudo means with the super user permission by default you don't have the permissions to access and look for those kind of devices and it again depends in here mac it showed me the information but if i would like to modify something it might ask me for sudo here also okay now if you see here in linux i said fdisk dev, dev sta minus l and it tells me that i have a 200 gb disk and then if i go and look for sdb so the way devices are named in linux for disk is dev sda sdb sdc like that in mac you see it's dev disk 0 disk 1 disk 2 that's the way so th there is a difference there now let's suppose i wanted to see like how many total devices i have so in linux at least there is no one single command which will tell you everything all together so you have to run a couple of commands together club together to get the understanding of your disk so there is the command like sf disk and then there are some g disk parted there are so many commands you have to go through all of this and you have to see so it says you are not a super user i'll cancel it because you have to run it as super user and you could say list and you can run some of the commands here and see okay what all the things you have you can say print and it will print you like this so what is your volume and what is the partitions and everything so this command makes little bit difference between mac and linux but apart from that it's exactly the same so happy coding start coding in bash shell scripting it will work if it doesn't work or you find some difficulties just drop me a message in a forum or send me personalized email or message and I will respond to your queries. Thank you all for watching this video and you have a nice time. Bye. Hello friends. Welcome to the Bash Shell Scripting tutorial. So in this video, we will try to go through some of the default directory which are present in a system in typical system of linux or unix so i have listed some of those directories which are present now not all these directories might be present in all the systems for example uh, unix even though is a posix compliant system but it has many things which are different compared to linux so for example slash sys file system might not be present in unix or maybe slash proc file system might not be present in unix or solaris but it is present in linux so most of my tutorials are targeting linux with respect to ubuntu operating system but many of those materials will apply to any other kind of operating system which are posix compliant so let's try to look the first file system which is slash bin slash is typically called as root the top list level is the root the top level and inside that all other folders are either mounted or present so we'll go through the concepts of mounting and everything in later videos so as of now we'll just see what is it so slash bin so root is the top level directory so let me show you another diagram so that it makes this diagram clear so root would be the topmost folder and inside the root there will be a bin folder which is slash bin which means it belongs to the root so that's the relations between root and bin so slash bin contains the system binaries 
home directory contains the user's home directory so it should be slash home and inside the home it should be a user like john or a tom or something else dev contains the block device and character device like dev sda for hard disk or dev stb for hard drive or maybe ssd drives dev sdb and etc contains system wide configuration file slash lib contains shared libraries and linux kernel modules like lib slash lib slash libc.so that is the shared library same thing with lib64 but it is containing 64 bit versions of the shared library slash var contains data which varies over time like var lib mysql so mysql database might be present in slash var partitions or maybe uh, log files are present in var log messages those kind of things sbin contains binary utilities for which only root file system or administrator has access mnt is mount point for the file system typically mnt might be empty but it might also be mounted for some servers if you log into some servers and mnt might not be empty which means someone has mounted some file system into this particular directory temp is for storing temporary data and files slash proc is with respect to linux kernel data structures which are mounted as read only file system we will go through this proc in some of the later videos slash boot contains the init ramfs and the linux kernel image to boot and slash is again is a kernel data structure very similar to proc but it's a different kernel data structure and both are part for linux but ct is more modern and proc is old but it used to be having a different purpose with respect to like uh, mounting and seeing the PID of a running process or open file descriptors memory map and this is more with respect to what are the different kinds of hardware are there what is the hardware UID is there what is the different kinds of ACPI and those kind of things so if you look this hierarchy it is like this this is my root file system inside that there will be folder called usr and inside the folder usr there might be an include folder and inside the include folder there might be one typical file which is always present in all kinds of unix and linux kind of operating system which is unistd there might be stdlib.h or maybe some other kinds of header files slash bin contains some utilities so in, inside the slash bin and there might be other files i have not shown all the diagrams and all the combinations here this layout is just to give you some idea how does a typical file system looks like uh, and that does not mean that okay slash bin will not have anything it might have and it has many things but just for clarity purpose i am showing just a part of the tree similarly for slash home there might be two users like tom and john but there might be a number of users and slash lib has shared library and slash etc now let's try to look into a command uh, there is a command called tree in case if you don't have this command in your linux system you can install by saying apt get install excuse me apt get install tree so uh, it is pretty straightforward so if you go to any folder like right now i am in slash home in my home directory and if i list there is a folder called desktop so if I run tree and with the folder desktop, it would list out, okay, what all the files it looks like, how it looks like the entire directory hierarchy. If I go to the slash root and I say root or maybe you don't need to go to root also, you can run from any place, but I just went there and tree slash. So it will list out in a tree structure how it looks like. So let's try to do a small demo. I make a directory mkdir john and i go inside the john cd john don't worry if you don't know all these commands we will go through these commands in later videos so there is called tom and then there is called kelly and inside the tom there is a file called vi test dot sh and i will say echo hi there now if i come out of this and you say pwd and you say tree and then you see so it shows like this so the john has a folder called kelly and tom and tom has a file called sh test.sh so this tree command shows the tree structure it's a very useful command 
just for understanding this command may not be very useful when writing the cell script because the output like this might not be good to process you might have to take a ascii format remove all those formatting lines like this pipe characters it formats and presents it you have to remove all those things but this is nevertheless a good command to understand for the beginners so that's all for this video and we will post more videos more utilities more tools so thanks for watching welcome to the bash shell scripting guide in this video we will look at some of the concepts of operating system these concepts are similar in terms of linux and all other modern operating system so we'll look specifically with respect to linux so even though the course is for linux and bash uh, but this applies to an operating system such as Mac OS X or FreeBSD as well. So the first concept is multitasking. What is multitasking? Multitasking is means that there are many processes running simultaneously in the system without interfering with each other. And each process would run for a short amount of time and then it goes to the end of the queue and then some other process gets scheduled. So this happens so frequently that it gives the notion that all of the processes are running in parallel. But in fact, what's happening behind is at a time only certain instruction sets. In fact, on one processor core, only one instructions can run at a time. So which means that one process is running and it has executed some n number of instructions and then the CPU schedule, the kernel scheduler comes into picture and it preempts that process and some other process is scheduled to run on the processor, on that same core of the processor. And this switching back and forth happens so frequently, probably in terms of nanoseconds, that with our bare eyes, we could not make out whether this process is running continuously or it is pausing and running. So this is how multitask is scheduled. So it's the main role is CPU schedule. CPU schedules on many different algorithms like round robin or FIFO or maybe some other algorithms. And that has been the scope of this course. But that's how it works. The other concept is multi-user. What it means is that multiple users can log into the system simultaneously and they can run same kind of commands without interfering with each other again in the same way so let's suppose one user tom has logged in through telnet and the other user john has logged in through ssh and they are both running ls command into the top level slash root folder they both can see simultaneously same files but they have different contexts each user when they run a program when they run a program a separate executable gets spawned and it is in his context it runs in the context of that particular user id mm. so that way the operating system can minimize the clash between different users in fact there is no clash between different users and each user will have a different set of disk quota how much disk you can use one user cannot monopolize or maybe use like one terabyte or entire disk space so we can also give this quota by default this quota is not enabled but if needed we can put this quota for each user the last concept is multiple cores what is multiple cores it means that modern all the modern processors they have more than one core even though they have physical one socket they can have multiple cores or hyper thread so one there might be one socket and then four hyper cores which we call it as quad core and same thing with respect to eight cores or four cores or core to duo like two cores so when there are multiple cores then multiple cores can run some of the instructions in parallel and of course like let's suppose there is one program running and with respect to that programs if there are multiple instructions which are running on different cores then there has to be some kind of synchronizations method with respect to operating systems those synchronizations are mostly spin locks which happens across different cores or maybe within the same course 
it could be mutexes or semaphores so that way we can utilize multiple cores also by using spin locks in the operating system in the kernel so that multiple cores are running the instructions in parallel now spin locks is a kernel data structures and those who are working with kernel or kernel programming or maybe in c they need to understand that fully i have told spin locks just for the purpose of giving some introduction and know how but spin locks is not a part of bash or shell programming thank you for watching my video hello and welcome friend let's try to look at some of the nitty gritties of environment variable so before we start let me confirm that on my right hand side i have my machine as linux as you can see with the unem command unem command will give you the name of a kernel operating system if you say unem minus a it will tell you everything the name of a kernel the machine name the kernel version is it a symmetric multiprocessing it's i686 or x86 or maybe like 64 bit and everything else same thing on my left hand side i have mac os x and if i say uname it will just say darwin and if i say uname minus a it will give me all the details so just to confirm i have the environment set up correctly and mind it i'm working on mac but this machine here is my virtual machine hosted in VMware workstation inside my Mac so that's the way I'm able to access I could have used SSH to some remote machines also not necessarily I need to have a virtual machine I could have SSH to a virtual machine on some other host or maybe to some other physical appliance okay now in, let's try to look at environment variables so what are environment variables environment variables are set of variables which are already defined in your system for some of the things which are logical or which are always needed like let's suppose path the path from where the binary needs to be picked up so let's quickly run this command first to see what it shows exactly so if you see here in environment variable you will see the path and what exactly the path dictate is that when you are running some binary what is the path where it will start looking at so let's suppose you executed a command called abc just randomly abc and if it's not able to find out abc what it will do is it will try to look in this path first or oh, if abc exists if it exists it will execute from this directory and done if it's not find here then it will go to the next uh next directory in the path and then next and then this if it's find anywhere whichever first it finds it will execute and it's done if it doesn't finds in any of this then it will say command not found file not found whatever blah 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 so this defines the environment variable now if you see here the difference between mac and linux in terms of environment is the directory the way directory is created in mac if you see most of the binary whichever you use is in library or is it in application part but here the same thing in linux would be not applications there is no slash library in linux in fact if you see here there's no slash library so linux follows the typical unix way of user local bin user bin slash bin slash has been those kind of things mac also follows but they have some additional path so these are some of the small things now if you see current working directory here my home directory is home shakil and here users slash users so usually in mac they say slash users not slash home but that's again convention this can be changed in linux so but what i am saying is by default what comes okay now these are the variables so also one way to visualize environment is if you guys are aware of java and has worked in the java in the path with respect to class path so you set a class path you set an environment variable name and then followed by list of directories separated by semicolon in windows or maybe colon in linux and then you say okay find my java files in this 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 folder so it's the same thing so it will help you in understanding now here if you see here 
I don't have a variable called hello. So let's try to do one quick experiment. I have this last script and I would say echo hello and what we'll do. So this hello variable is not defined anywhere. So what will happen if I run this script? You see I run hello and there's no output because it's not defined anywhere. Now what I do is I say env and then in the env I will say a variable name equals to the sum value world and if I run env I should be able to see this world also somewhere it should be listing somewhere I'll have to just search so okay let me see env once env part 2 grab hello so it is there I'm not able to see quickly here somehow but if I grab it, so it's there. So echo hello has a value called world. So what it means is there is an environment variable called hello, which has been set by running this command and the value assigned value is world for that. Now let's run the test script which I ran earlier. You see the value is still not there. So what, why it's not there? Because when you're setting the environment variable, and if you want another cell to be exported, what you have to do is you have to prepend with the command called export. Now, if you run the export command and you run the cell script, you will get world hello. So if you see my script here, I don't have a hello anywhere defined, but still if I run this, I will get the hello. Now in this, if I want to unset that, how will I do that? So the way to unset a variable is you say env minus u and you unset hello. Now it will also display everything uh, but at the same time it will unset. Now since it unsets, let's try to run this. What will happen now? You might assume that it will not work because you have unset the variable. Now see it is still working. The reason because it has been removed from the environment variables but the variable has been exported. So you have to remove from the environment variable as well as you have to do unset. Now, if you unset a particular variable, hello, that means it's gone. So the shell also doesn't have this variable. Now, if I run this, you will see that it doesn't have that value and there is no hello. So that's why it just gives me a blank empty thing. So you have to remember unset means it will unset the value from the current terminal also. ENV will just remove from the environment variable. So when exactly? So then you might be confused when environment will be used when the current shell would be used. Let's suppose you are writing a shell script, uh, not exactly shell script, maybe C, C++ and you pass an environment variable. In that case, the environment variable environment would be useful. When you are running a bash shell, most of the time you are also getting your whatever is there as part of your current bash console or bash terminal those variables also get exported if you have exported with the keyword export so things would be a little bit more clear as we advance in the course and we see different examples but if, if you don't understand some part don't worry you will understand later on also i would like to point out that there is one special path uh, by default when we say path we refer to dollar path but there's something called ld library path and which i felt is useful to know because if you want to run particular library from some predefined path you have to set this ld library path the way to set is you can say export export ld library path equals to some path now let's suppose I will say slash lib64 and if I say echo dollar ld underscore library underscore path. So it will say lib64. So what this means is that when a particular library, let's suppose someone is searching for libc and if the libc is not there in ld preload or in the etc ld preload it will try to look in ld library path so there is set of path in which the library gets loaded again that is some of them are platform dependent it works differently on mac os x and it works slightly different in linux 
but the way to set ld library path is same so you see here if i set the ld library path it will it will tell me okay this is the path i wanted to use for library path now what this means is that there might be some data right now i don't have any data but what it means i just have a current directory dot means current directory so if i have some data in the past and if i want to set it it will override and it will set just with this what if i want to retain the existing value and add something to that so that's why it's always advisable that if you are setting up an environment variable you don't set like that what you have to do is you have to set always with whatever the current value is so you preserve the current value so it's so you preserve the current value and then you add something new now let's suppose this time i say slash bin so i will take a value of ld library path and separate it by this colon so it will add now this time if i say echo dollar ld library path So you see it was using whatever was there in the previous run and then followed by slash bin and same thing will happen on Linux also. So this is the way to set the LD library path. Same thing you will use for setting your path variable also. So all this path they are separated by colon. So that means this is one directory. This entire thing is one directory and separated by semicolon then another directory. So if you quickly want to set some path so you can say exp and mind it. If you set a path just with the path variable it will not be exported to another cell if you really want to be exported to all the new shell which you spawn you'd have to see that so you say export path equals to dollar path colon suppose my shaker something like this whatever it has to be valid path now if you say echo dollar path you will see my shaker okay so let me show you something quickly now when I say export, let's suppose you don't say export and you say my shekel one two. Let's suppose. And if you say echo dollar path, so you will see that my shekel one two is there. Now if I want to spawn a new shell, I can just say bash. Uh, bash will trigger a new shell and it went to a new shell so if you might have not seen any difference because it's just the same terminal same shell but actually the shell got changed what if i do echo dollar path now what will happen now you see there's no shekel too okay so if you look at my tty the terminal type you see it's a dave tty s001 the way tty is there in linux uh, just to mention the difference between mac and linux the way tty is main uh, is uh, is represented in Linux and Mac is slightly different so you'll see like this so you see the TTY number is TTY S001 if I come out of that and with control D so I press control D then only it exited I, you could have said exit also and then you see S001 TTY is still there now in this terminal if I say echo dollar path you see shakil2 is there so when I spawn a new shell by bash command and I went to that shell, I don't see shekel variable, shekel one two variable. But in the shell where I have executed, I was able to see. Why? The reason is when you set a path like this, what will happen is it will set for the current shell only. So if you want a new shell which gets spawned and in that shell you need this variable, you have to say export path. And that way it will work if you're spawning a shell running a script there it will work for you so that's the reason for the keyword export so thank you all for watching this video and i hope to see you in my next video you have a nice day bye in guide in this tutorial we will try to look at some of the commands which linux has to offer most of these commands also applies to Unix and Unix like operating system like Mac, OS X or FreeBSD. The first command which we would try to look is ls which is for listing the files and folders. So by default if you issue the command ls it will list out all the files and folders which are present in the current directory. If you want to list out the files and folders into some other path maybe slash root which is the root folder of 
the entire Linux system it will list out like that ls command has couple of options which respect to what all the ways it can display stuff so if I want to list out the detail list of ls I have to give the option ls so the options in Unix are mostly prefix with the hyphen letter and then followed by some options so in this case the options for ls is minus l which is a long listing of the files and folders so let's try to go at some of the fields which ls minus l has to offer as part of listing of the files and folders so if you look at the first row this is the file name which i am looking at and when there is a hyphen in the front which means it's a file when there is a D in the front it means it's a directory but then this is a file so it's a hyphen and then this field is for the permissions it's a read write and execute we will go through in more details in some other video but for this is the read write and execute permissions for the user then the next three fields are read the write is blank which means it doesn't have write permissions and execute so it has read and execute permissions for the group and then this field is for other so other also has the read and execute permissions it doesn't have write permissions so so this three field is for user and the user has read write execute permission this is for user group group has read and execute permissions and other also have read and execute permission but no right permission then the next thing what we have is a link basically this tells me how many files and folders are present inside this so basically how many links it has not exactly file but it has how many links since it's a file it doesn't have any other file containing inside a file is just a standalone entity it doesn't have anything inside that so by default for file the link would be one then this is the user name who has created this file this is the group which file belongs to then this is the size of the file and then this is the day month and time some time this is time this is the day and this is the month and this is the file name now let's try to look at this link thing what is this link so this link basically tells how many files and folders are there in that particular directory so let's go to the folder called desktop or maybe some other folders and try to look how many files and folders so if i go here this has only one directory and then each folder has two for two directories by default which is called as dot and dot dot so there is a folder called dot and then there's a folder called dot dot these two are special files and folders file folders basically which is present in all the directories so by default it's hidden the way to look at it is minus a options minus a ls minus la l is long listing and you can combine the option a which shows hidden files and folders it will tell you this so if i look into this directory i have three four directories one is this dot the other is dot dot and then this is the third one so this directory contains three directories so that's the reason if i go here and look at my desktop my desktop says a link of three because it has three folders inside it dot 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 and maybe some other shahid underscore project similar way if i go into this folder john it says a link of four if i go to the john it has two directories one is tom one is kelly but then two of them are hidden which is dot and dot dot i can see the hidden files and folders with the option a so this is what it explains and then this is the size of the files and folders now for file the size is straightforward it says 785 so this means this size whatever i file i have that has a size of 788 bytes so let me go and open that file this is just some test file i was just looking at 
so if you look into this entire file size this is 785 bytes but in case of directory which is prepended by the letter d the size is 4096 and you will see that if you create any new directory the size will come as 4096 so let me make a directory called tutorial and if i look at the directory ls minus l you see the size is 4096 so by default what happens whenever a directory is created there is a space allocation which is in terms of blocks and that block size is 4096 which means to store the metadata inside that directory so what is the metadata the metadata is the directory says how many directories inside it is there and how many link files are there those kind of things so by like we have seen that each directory contains a dot and dot dot so basically those are stored as a metadata so this is the space allocations by default it's 4096 chunk the next thing we will look as is inode the concept of inode if you look into the unix operating system in unix or linux all the files which are stored in the system they are stored in some particular physical blocks now those blocks might not be ordered in the right way some of the blocks might be deleted and then some other data can come and fill up those blocks so the way they arrange the file system is they prepare a list of inode and the inode will look like this you can see the inode with an options i so li and you can combine that you can say lia which is list out all the files and folders which is a list me the inode and long listing and it will show like this if you want to, to remove the long listing it will just say you inode like this so let's go through the long listing inode so what this tells me is so if you have seen that earlier my data was starting from here when i was displaying the files and folders it was displaying like this but now there is another field called i the inode field is displayed first so which means it says that wherever this data leaves this data for the file a dot out leave that belongs to block so in the system entire hard drive is segregated or made up of many such blocks depending upon the file system hierarchy layout and this particular file a dot out leaves in this block so whenever someone wants to access this file the operating system knows to get to go and fetch the data from this particular blocks similarly for this particular xml file it will go and fetch the data from this particular inode so inodes are data structures in the kernel particularly mostly with respect to file system where it knows which block has the data so inode entry has the, all the known values to fetch the block data and it can go and look for that data it's basically a linked list so that's about ls now the other useful command which we have is cd cd means change directory if i want to go from one directory to another it's a cd so right now if you look typically i have customized my bash rc script to display me my current working folder which is my home directory home slash shakil but we, we will look into all this kind of customizations later on so if you look at the typical first time installations of ubuntu or enemy you will not see like this for me it's like this because i have customized to show my past current working directory present working directory so if i want to go to some particular folder i will say cd cd means change directory so i will go to the slash root now if i say pwd it will tell me which is present working directory it will say slash root and ls minus l will say me different things you remember i am no more having the dropbox and those kind of folders or a dot out because i am in the root folder of my operating system this root folder is denoted by forward slash so mind it there is forward slash root which is the home directory for the root user and then there is a root file system which is denoted like this so both are different this is the home directory slash root and the root file system is denoted by forward slash so this forward slash tells me that okay i can go to this cd forward slash which is here and i can stay at any folder and go into any path so let's suppose i want to go to my home directory so from my root folder itself 
which is the root file system I can go to my home directory and mind it in Linux there is a shell command completion so if you press the tab and if you have the right types of files and folders already present it will complete your command so you don't need to type entire thing if I have just SH and I press the tab and it completes for me and then inside Shakil if you want to go into some particular it will list out all the options so if I say DE so it will list out if I just say D and then tab tab it will give me two options with, because with D there is only two folders which is there which is desktop and Dropbox and it doesn't know which one I am planning to go so I have to give one more later to make it a right judgment that okay I wanted to go to the desktop now inside the desktop again you will show all the files and folders where it can go or it can read or do something so this is about CD command so we have looked at LS various options with LS we have looked at the CD command okay now in LS suppose if I want to list out the files and folders in a long list which is fine if I want to reverse that order and maybe I will sort out by time then I have to give the options LRT which is a very important command many times you will use it in live scenarios wherein you want to list out all the files in some sorted way based on the time and maybe in a reverse order or non reverse so if you look here this is in the reverse order in the sense like ascending order so this file was created this directory so mind it in linux directories and files are almost similar the data structures they are both same just that directory can contains further directories a file cannot have any more files or folders or directories inside it that is the only difference but in terms of data structures representations and everything in linux and unix the file and directory are exactly similar exactly similar uh, my the difference is only because files cannot have any more files inside it it can just have the data in that file so now here if you see that uh, okay so John was created on December 18th then this was M loss underscore expr on December 23rd and like this this was created just now I have created on December 31st so this is the way we can say if we don't give the minus are options which means that it will be now in the descending order rather than ascending order so we can use the reverse order and this t is for time if I don't give the time then it will just list out in some ASCII order in the sense the way it appears small a first then small d capital D after that H something like that now there are a lot of options with respect to ls like if i want if i have a file which is very huge and i don't want to see in terms of bytes i don't want to calculate oh how many bytes are there so there is options called lh l is again long listing but uh, you can just use separately also like this you can use like this so which means that it will give me in human readable format and what it means is instead of bytes or kilobytes it will like in terms of numbers it will give me the prefix k or h or m that okay it's a kilobyte or a megabyte or gigabyte so here I have a very small file so it's not giving me that option but if I wish to I could create a large file any point of time like let me just quickly create one file which is very big in size there is some junk data and then I will say hello.txt and done so I'll have to go I forgot to give the do so while true then say do and say echo some data into some file and hello.txt and whatever and do done now if you see here it will very quickly just create a file size which is this large two three four eight six bytes now if I give the options ls minus lh it will tell me in terms of see hello.txt 230kb so this is 230kb I can combine the options R and T which means give me a human readable format with reverse order which is ascending order and then based on the time now if you see here I can see out I can list out the files and folders and I can see oh this is 230k instead of, of like going and calculating okay how much 
bytes it's a kb or it's a mb or what not gb so that's the advantage of h the options h then there are a lot of options in ls command itself probably 50 or hundreds of options we will not go through each of them because that doesn't make sense and most of the people don't use all the options but as and when needed you can look in the man page so what is man page in linux and unix a man page is a manual for a particular commands or maybe some apis so here ls is a command if you type man ls it will list out all the different options which you can see with respect to ls like we were looking for a which is minus minus all which will show all the files and folders so in unix anything which starts with dot as a file name or a directory name that's a hidden file which means normally it will not show but if you give an options minus a it will try to show those hidden files and folders so if you see here there are a lot of options with respect to everything so you can read through that and then for the man page itself you want you want to find out some details about the man page then there is a man for a man so you can do a man manual for the man page itself and navigate and look for the options with respect to different commands but most of the time if you know the name of the command you can go for man ls and look for that sometimes you can always get the help with minus h options but here minus h for ls doesn't apply because minus h is like a human readable format but for many commands it will help so let me see if that has so it doesn't have h but in many of the commands you will see the minus h option as a help option so they will have like that now if i want to exit this terminal there is a command called exit once you type exit it will exit that terminal and you can open another console so let me open another console and look at my settings i am using a zoom profile so that it looks better so like that the other options you want to exit the terminal is control d when you say control d that's the end of the input and it will also terminate your console so in this i am using in ubuntu and the console i am using is called as console by default it comes with xterm but i am using this console if you look in the normal ubuntu there is a xterm so you can install console with the command apt get minus y install console and you have to prepend the command with sudo so once you do that you will see console and you can open the console from here you can type console and it will start so right now i have already installed the switch there but once you installed and you can also go and find the console so thank you all for this video and we'll see you in the next video hello friend what's up in this lecture we will try to look at some of the linux commands which is used for creating a file or deleting a file so the first command which you will try to look is a cat cat is again another very versatile command and one of the most useful command after ls so cat is also used for checking what is there in the file as well as you can create a file with a cat command you can create a file with the vi command as well so let's try to directly look into some of the examples let's suppose i want to create a file abc.txt so the way you can do is you can say cat and greater than sign abc.txt don't worry about the redirection now we will cover this redirection but what you can think of now is what we can do is whatever we are typing as part of this redirections it's getting redirected to this file so whatever we are typing it's being taken as an input for the cat command and which gets redirected or appended to the file abc.txt that's all so which means we will create a file abc.txt here you can start writing some text hi this is a text file and you can continue doing typing as long as you wish to and when you're done you have to press ctrl d so ctrl d is a end of input in linux in windows it's ctrl z just for the knowledge i'm telling you guys but ctrl d is the end of input for linux 
so you can open the file and you or maybe you can just do a cat so when you say cat without any redirection see when you say redirection that means you're creating a file abc.txt when you don't give this redirection which means no greater than sign which means you are listing out the contents of the file if the file is not present suppose i will say it will say no such file or directory it's an error but when the file is present it will tell you whatever is the content of a file this is the content which we have typed here hi this is a text file and some garbage data this is what we type and this is what is there we can confirm this by opening in one of the editors which is vi or something if you have vi and you can see so cat command is used for listing the files as well as creating the files now let's suppose i have two files so i have already abc.txt and then i have another file abc1.txt and this is has some more data hello world suppose so if i want to concatenate two files i could say okay cat abc.txt and then abc1.txt and we can create something greater than greater than or maybe here we can just with one greater than which is a redirection which we will look again we could say new underscore file dot txt so what happens cat will list out the content of this file and then cat will list out the content of this file and together both of them will go and sit in this new file called new file dot txt so if i look now new file dot txt it will have the contents from the file number one which was and this is the content from file 2 and they got concatenated if the file has a multi-line content suppose what i mean to say by that is if the file is very big file suppose new file is big i will add some text here so <clears throat> maybe some hundreds of lines a lot of lines so if i say cat new <coughs> excuse me it has a lot of lines so i can pipe it so again pipe and redirections we will cover very soon but cat command is something which is very basic before we go ahead with the pipe we have to learn cat so that's why i am displaying but nevertheless think pipe as some kind of piping a output from one command to the other and when i say more or less that means it says display one screenshot at a time more means keep pressing and if i say press space bar or enter it will display me the list of the contents one page at a time so that's about more command so we'll go through that but i was trying to demo the cat command in this so we have seen how to create a file now since this file is created if i want to delete this file the command is rm rm is remove so if you say rm abc.txt and I mind it, I'm giving tab for all the command completions. So I don't need to type that much. So RM will remove the file. If I say ls minus la again, there is no file called abc1.txt. If you look here, there is no file abc1.txt that has been deleted. So, so I'm sorry, I removed the file abc.txt, not abc.1. So there is no file abc.txt here, but abc.1 is here. So I have deleted this file. If I want to remove this guy also, I will say I will say rm minus fr abc. Uh, maybe I'll just use rm command fr. I will introduce you very soon. So it has removed this file now. If I say ls minus l, there is no file called abc one dot txt. So rm will remove a file or a folder. So when I say file or a folder, so we have deleted the file. If you mind it, I said that file is denoted by hyphen like this and folder is by D. D means directory. So this is a directory. Let's suppose we want to try to delete this with rm command. And what it does, it says, it says cannot remove is a directory. So I said you that rm can remove files in folders. So what happens? The condition is when rm command runs, and it wants to delete a directory the del directory itself has to be empty so if i go inside this directory and i see they have no content so this directory is not there so rm cannot delete this so it still thinks that okay there are some content so what you have to do is you have to say rm minus fr which means a recursive 
so f is stands for force and r stands for recursive so you can go ahead and recursively delete this directory and now it will be done rmtut now let's suppose if i treat create a direct again and say rm and i show you that rm doesn't work for this because rm is a directory so i can do a recursive directory then it can delete but if i just have a directory and i want to remove then i can issue the command called rmdir and rmdir will not complain rmdir will delete a directory rmdir will not say okay is a directory so rmdir is for deleting a directory rm is used for deleting a directory file recursively everything so rm is more generic in terms of deleting the only thing is when you want to delete a directory with rm you have to give the option rf so the option for deleting is rf mind it whenever you use this command you know what you are doing it will delete and the file is deleted permanently although you can recover the data but as a as a new user you will not be able to recover the data so you know what you are doing f means force and r means recursively and the way recursive works is inside the directory there are some more folders files it will delete everything recursively so that's rm dir and rm minus fr now let's demonstrate again so there is this folder called tester i want to delete it with rm dir now let's see what happens that says it cannot direct directory is not empty so rm dir needs the directory to be empty which it is deleting which doesn't make sense you are deleting so why it needs to be empty what the command is like that so if i had have used rm minus fr history it would have worked it would have just deleted everything so that's why i said rm is much better than rm dir now let's suppose if i want to use rm dir to delete this directory what i have to do is i have to go inside the tester folder and then inside the tester folder there is another directory you delete that and maybe if there is something else inside that you have to delete that so you have to keep deleting everything which is inside this and then come back so now there is empty so till this level there is nothing after this level so i come back and i say rmdir for this and then i will delete this and this is done there is no folder called sida sds now i come back and i see here the tester folder sales minus l and then i say rmdir tester now since this directory is empty this directory doesn't have any child directory inside it so rmdir will work for me so that's why you cannot like sometimes you just want to just drop a node delete everything inside a folder you don't care what is there so this rmdir is not so useful so best thing is you always use it rm minus rf and whatever the name of the directory or files or folders you have mind it it will forcefully delete everything and it will delete recursively so you know what you are doing okay so we have seen the command mkdir mkdir is for making a directory so mkdir tester if i say so just to recap mkdir is for creating a directory cat is for creating a file or reading a file uh, and mkdir for making a directory now all these commands which we are which we are doing and if we want to reference back so in linux there is always this history command there is a command called history and it lists out all the histories which you are doing so sometimes you have to close that terminal to know the history but you can see what all the commands we are running and there is a shortcut also if you want to just refer to the previous command you can say not h so not h will also list out the history this might not be available in all distros but it is there in ubuntu i'm using ubuntu 16.10 and 16.04 for making this tutorial so this is a history command if you want to delete the contents of the history this history is stored in your home directory my home directory is home shakil and then there is a file called bash underscore history dot bash underscore history mind it this dot means it's a hidden file we have seen in the first tutorial so you have all the contents here right now it doesn't source because when the system loads up it loads from the memory all the history 
so if I exit this first let me show it if I exit this and try to load this history I have this profile zoom and now if I look into the history dash history it will show me all the commands which we have run so it has loaded in the history file because it was leave, keeping it into memory of community and then at the certain intervals or at the end of the session it will load up into bash history so this is a bash history file if i want to delete this i will just delete everything save it come back control a and then again open the terminal and then i will see that okay there is nothing in my history if i say history now only the last few commands which we ran as part of VA is there. All other commands are gone. So history is not there. So history is one quick way of referring what all the commands you have run in the past. Also, history has uh, some limitations in terms of how many commands it saves. It doesn't save uh, all the files uh, or folders infinitely. There is an environment variable for history size and based on the size, it will truncate the file. So it will like remove the previous contents if the file size grows too large also if you want to run the same session if you want to run what all the previous command you ran you can use the up arrow and then you can see what all the previous commands here we have run very few commands so i'm not able to see now because i have deleted all the history but i can run a couple of the commands and let's see so tester cat test.cpp file is there and then ls minus l and then i go to hello and now if i do up and down arrow for me i can see all the commands which we have running which i am running now so guys this is all about mkdir rmdir rm cat and i will see you in the next video thank you very much for watching hello friend in this video we will try to look at some of the linux commands like cp and move and clear so the first command which we will look is cp which is used for copying a file and cp can be used for copying a file as well as directory and it can be used to copy things in a recursive way so let's try to look at the basic commands first so here in this folder in my folder i have a file called test.cpp so i would like to take a backup or a copy of this file so the command is like this copy and then the source file followed by the destination file i would say test underscore dst.cpp so test.cpp contents will get will go and copy into test underscore destination.cpp if i look here list minus l test underscore destination it has exactly the same size as whatever test.cpp has 785 bytes so it got copied to a destination which is test underscore destination now let's suppose i want to see whether it really got copied or it was just referring to this file so we can again use the ls minus li command i is for inode and we can look for the inode so the inode for test.cpp is these things 30603016 and the inode for test underscore destination is 603530 so if you see the contents are same the inode got changed which means the file gets copied and really written to some other blocks into hard drive and then that some other block is a different inode different space in the hard drive that's the way copy works it takes something and just duplicates and writes over the contents from one particular block to some other block so this is for a simple file now let's suppose if i have a file and a folder inside that like a typical way a folder containing files and folders and subfolders and files so how do we copy that so let's try to create something like that so i will create a directory called mkdir abc inside the abc directory i go inside the abc directory and create one more directory create hello inside the hello i will create a file touch one two three in the one two three i write something some data and then i save it and come back now in the abc folder i will go to the top of abc folder and sorry i'll go inside the abc folder create one more directory mkdir and then there's a directory called hello one 
Now let's suppose if I want to copy entire thing, I say copy ABC to maybe ABC underscore destination. It will not work because it doesn't know that it has it's a file or it's a directory and how to copy it. So the way you can do a copy of a directory by taking everything like it's uh, sub content sub directories and everything you have to do a recursive copy and the recursive is minus r and also you can say f option sometimes the destination folder already exists and you would like to overwrite then you say minus r f which is force and once you do that now if you go ahead and see the destination will have the exact same hierarchy as abc so if you look at there is a command called tree and it shows the hierarchy if you don't have it you can uh, do sudo apt-get install tree in ubuntu so if i run tree command abc it shows the tree structure so abc is a directory inside the directory there is a directory called hello which has a file one two three and then abc directory has another file called hello one and if i run the same command with abc underscore dst i will see the exact same picture this and this are the same and if we want to verify manually we can go inside the abc underscore dst and i can see exactly the same thing if i go inside hello one then this hello one has nothing and if i go to hello and it should have a file called one two three and if i look at the contents of one two three it has some data so this is the way cp command works so if i want to just copy a file so the command is copy source and then destination if i want to copy folders and files and directories to some other folders and files then i have to say cp space minus r f r is for recursive f is for forcefully just for security that if there is some contents already and you would like to write you can say minus f and then followed by the destination for source and destination folder so cp minus r f source directory and destination directory so source has to exist destination if it doesn't exist it doesn't matter now the next command which we will look is move move is used for moving a file from one location to another and it's also used for renaming a file so let's look for first example let's suppose i want to rename this file to maybe some better name like butter.cpp so i would say move and then whatever the file name i have and i would say butter.cpp if i look now i will see butter.cpp it has been renamed and mind it when we renamed it the inode remains the same so let's suppose let's do it once again the inode for butter.cpp is 6035382 and if i rename it which is basically moving butter.cpp to caramel.cpp and if i say ls minus li caramel.cpp the inode what was there earlier remains the same which means this data exists in some block in hard drive and once you rename it the metadata gets changed the actual contents doesn't move it is not like it is taken away and rewritten to some other locations or moved the data doesn't get physically moved just the file name gets removed the old file name got removed and new file name gets written that's the way move command works same thing happens with the directory let's suppose if i want to rename this directory abc underscore dst to something abc underscore new underscore dst it just moves so it just renames the top level directory with all the links and everything pointing inside it remaining the same so if i want to look at the ls minus li options for this directory for looking at the inode value so it will remain the same if you don't know what is an inode please read go through my previous video and i have explained the concept of inode and inodes are basically a address or a block of data which is being referenced by some number so when a data is stored at some particular blocks that particular block number is referred as inode number and it has some other details like the metadata and the how many links the directory has and what all the files it has by default the size allocation for an inode value is 4096
so those kind of things are there so you can read about the inert so this is about move command so we have seen the move the basic syntax for both the commands are same and move also has the options minus i which is interactive suppose if you already have a files or folders existing at some place and you want to move with some of the files so suppose i have a file this and i want to move this override this file so i would say move i could have done with the copy command but not copy takes the data and copies it but move actually moves the data in the sense it changes the name it renames the block so now if i say move hello.txt to caramel.cpp but let me do one more example for you before i do that let's look at the inode number for hello.txt and the inode number for caramel.cpp before i do any move operation so you see these are two different data at two different blocks with two different inode now let's suppose if i say move excuse me move hello.txt to caramel.cpp this is done now there is no more caramel.cpp file here if i say ls minus li caramel.cpp sorry i'm sorry there is no more hello.txt because hello.txt has been moved to caramel.cpp so caramel.cpp is there but hello.txt is no more there so there is no more hello.txt now if i look for ls minus li for hello.txt there is nothing and then if i look for caramel.cpp i have this so now what you can see this the inode for caramel.cpp is 291 ending in 291 and previously the inode for hello.txt was 291 so which means that the file hello.txt has been simply renamed to caramel.cpp and whatever was there in the caramel.cpp this block of is still lying there somewhere but it has been dereferenced so that means you cannot recover the data through a normal means for caramel.cpp it has been removed so it, it this move and cp commands mostly work with the inode perspective inode is the one which through which we can manipulate so cp command is the one in which you actually copy the data and in move you just move the inode number you change the inode number with the right name and that's the way it works now after doing all these operations you want to clear your screen there's a command called clear and it will just make your screen looks good again and all the commands will be clear in terminal you can always scroll up and to see what is there you can take a history you can look inside the history we have already shown you how to run the history command so you can look like this and check for all the previous commands which we have done so move and cp is a very important command uh, please try to learn and understand more about it there are different options with respect to that so you can run man pages for rm move those kind of things so try to look into the options particularly options like minus i so if there is already a file or folder lying so it will ask for interactive mode if the interactive mode is turned on it will prompt you to say whether you want to override the file which is already existing because you have you want to override some other file with some name which is already existing in the system so that's about move similarly you can go through some of the options with respect to cp so man page should be your friend there are a lot of things in the man so try to go through the man page as much as possible in case if there is no man page installed then you can search in for ubuntu how to install man page there are a lot of links to install man pages thank you very much and have a nice day hello friends in this tutorial we will try to look at some of the unix command like who who am i which locate and pwd so the first command which you will look is who so who is used for finding out which all users are logged in in the system currently so i have the terminal open and i have logged in with my user id shakil and if i issue the command who it will tell me okay the there is a user called shakil logged in into the system so this command was useful when university student used to log into through different kinds of terminals to some systems and the teacher or professor wanted to know how many users has logged in into the system it is still useful 
not that useful from the cell script perspective but it is good to know uh, about the system that who all the system users are logged in in the system the other command which we have is a variant of who which is known as who am i it basically tells you what user i am so it will tell me that i am the user shakil now let's suppose there is another user called john in this system and if i don't log in with the john but i just change my user there is a command called su su is a change user which is basically super user but with super user i will give the name of the user so now i will become john so even though i started login as user shakil i change myself as john now all my credentials and everything is with respect to user john i am john now now let's suppose if i say who you see that it doesn't says john it still says shakil because john has not logged into the system through some terminal or ssh but if i say who am i it will tell me john because i am user john but it doesn't says that who, in terms of logged in users who john because john has not logged in now let me open one more terminal and increase the font here and let me check the ip address there is a command called if config with if config you can look the ip address of the system so this is my system ip address and i will log in as a user john so it's a local login even though i'm not logging remotely i could have done from my mac but let me try to log into this system again as a local user john through ssh and see what happens now if you see here if i go back maybe even i can do it here if i say who it will tell a john user so john user is logged in through a terminal pts7 so whenever a user logs in with anything the terminal window whichever it opens it is called as tty so if you type the command tty it will tell you which terminal you are in so john is logged in with terminal pts tty it tells you the time and from which ip address he has logged in so this is the way now this is through ssh so that's why you see the ip address from where it has logged in but if it is non ssh it will be just directly log into the system you will not see from which ip address it has logged in if i log in from my mac let me quickly do it through my mac and i will show you this is my mac john at the rate of 172.16.237.160 and i give the password now this is my mac even though i am logged into unix or linux you see it tells me that john is logged in one terminal is logged in through dot one and the other is through dot 60 160 so this 160 was through ssh on the terminal this terminal itself and then when i issued the ssh command through mac this is the one which login this is pts18 which is my tty so this is the way you can check who which user has logged in and who is my current user now if i say who am i here it will tell me john no more shakil if i say who am i here again it will say me john because i'm still logged in as a john even though i change su if i come out by saying control d which means exit out of that so i fall back to my user shakil and if i say who am i again it will tell me shakil and if i look who then this two john logged in one is from this terminal which is a tab in my console window and then one is from my macbook so this is the who command so we have looked at who commands and we have looked at tt tty tells me the basically terminal type so what is this terminal type and what is the name so this is tty pts 10 is one of the terminal pts 15 pts 17 whatever it is and if you logged in through some remote ssh then also you will get a terminal type now let's suppose if i have wanted to see where is this command is lying where is this who command or tty command so this is another command called which and it tells you the path of the command so if i say which tty which means it tells that tty is coming in the system from the user bin tty so in the path user bin there is a file called tty executable file 
which is get, is in the path and when we execute tty it gets executed so this is the file which gets executed so the equivalent is if i instead of tty if i could just say like this it will give me the same thing but we don't want to type so long so we'll just say tty because it's in the path so that's the command which there is another non-standard command nowadays which is called as locate which maintains the list of database so it's similar to mac and windows database creation it's not part of POSIX or original linux or unix but nowadays it's there so now so let's suppose if i say which it will list out all the files and folders which has which so if you say here it has the keyword which it has the keyword which this might not be very useful when you have a lot of stuff like that but let's suppose if i locate files and folders with the name john now you see it tells me rightly because there are very limited things in my system with the name john and it tells me the right thing but if you have a lot of contents which has something like which and you are trying to look for that it might be overwhelming and you might not get the right result you might not be able to see the data which you are trying to look in so much output so you might have to write some more customized script to look for that but nevertheless it is also one of the command so let's try to look at which command more if i say cd which is a change directory cd now you see here for cd which didn't return anything so all the commands which is there in shell belongs to two categories one is internal one is external external are those for which there is a external binary which is put in place as in the case of which which and which or ls which means this there is an external binary which I am using to get the command which but cd there is no such command cd is a shell inbuilt so whenever you get a bash shell it has some inbuilt command and cd is one of them now the other thing which you can look is which echo so echo is part of bin echo then you can say which ls ls is part of user bin ls ls is found at this location now let's see uh, which mkdir it's a bin mkdir which move it's a bin move so all the internal commands whichever you are there which uh, you are not able to find out with which command you can say for sure that it's a shell inbuilt internal commands rather than some external binary the other command which i would like to uh, you guys to know is pwd which is a present working directory so there are so many files and folders and you can navigate to any place in the system and you wanted to know where exactly you are so for me i have put an alias for my pwd in my um, bash rc script which i will cover in some later which video so but you can use the command pwd to know where exactly you are right now so right now i'm in my home directory if i move to the root folder which is like coming out of shakil so if i say shakil let's go to my home directory again so this is my home directory with the pwd command if i say cd dot dot i come out one directory which is in home now so if i say pwd i am in slash home now if i do again cd dot dot and then if i say pwd i am in root folder and if i say cd enter so whenever you type the command cd and enter without giving any directory name it always take you back to the home directory so if you are at any place and if you want to go at anywhere you can just give the path where exactly you want to go so if i want to go to forward slash i can use the command cd and i will say pwd and it will tell me where exactly now if i want to go to user and bin i can go i can say pwd i can list out all the contents here whatever we have and pwd will tell me where exactly i am right now so that's all for this video and i'll see you in next video thank you very much for watching this tutorial we will try to look at some of the command with respect to calendar and date so in linux there is a command called cal which displays the calendar so mind it the command is not calendar but cal because in unix or linux most of the time whenever we use a command we use a shorthand notation for being typing fast so we use the word cal for calendar not the entire word calendar so by default when you issue the command calendar it will show you the present month 
of the year now if you say cal 2017 it will show you the calendar of all the months when you give a year so cal 2017 will give you all the months if you want to have any particular month not the current month then you can say suppose cal 03 1978 and if someone wants to know which day you were born you can find out okay i was born in this day and it was monday something like that so cal 03 means march of 1978 pretty simple uh, it doesn't have much use but it is just for the fun the other command which we will look now is date date is again one of the very important command wherein it will be used in your cell script to determine whether particular file has been modified and when it was modified with respect to date what is the current date and things like that and the other problem with date is there are a lot and lot and lot of options with date and it is really confusing which date command you should use because of so many options and one more point of confusion with respect to date command is date is a command which is used to set the system date as well as it is used to set the system time as well as it is used to show the system date so it will be used for setting the system date as well as showing the system date so let's quickly jump into some of the date command so by default the command is date which is pretty simple if you type the date it will tell you the current date don't look at this date because it says august 2nd and i'm making this video in january 2017 because i just played with my date so i forwarded my date so this is the current date now if i want to see so this date is in pdt time zone if i want to see the date in universal time formatted which is a time somewhere in london so the current time in london with respect to whatever date i have would be august 2nd 22 54 11 utc so universal coordinated time is a greenwich mean time which is approximately equals to the time in london so date minus u will give you the date in utc format now if you see here date command gives you both the month day year everything and the current time also so date command gives you the time and date both there is no time command for setting or getting a time there is a time command but that is meant for a different purpose for getting the run time of a user system those kind of things from the time but date is the command which is used for setting the date and time both now it has some options we will go quickly go through some of the options one option is percentage t if you want to see only the time not the date you can say percentage t again this can be used in your cell script if you want to gauge some time what is the current time and you don't bother about date or something you can use like this then the other not so important option is percentage b it displays the full month like august it might be needed i'm not sure but it's there so i just wanted to show you then if you say percentage d it will display the day of the month like august 0 to which is the second day so if you see here day august 2nd so this is 0 to so day of the month and b is in a full format display the month its entire name it will not say a u g like here it will tell you the entire name august now if you say date plus percentage d so it will this is probably an important command you can make a note of this um, to display in the right format usually this is the format which in which we display the date so which is a month and day and a year two digit for the year and this percentage d doesn't shows you the time so you have to remember that then the next command is percentage f and which displays in the year month and day format separated by hyphen so again this also you can use it probably this command percentage f is better than percentage d because it has four letters for the year which is good so these are some of the options 
now it is really really confusing that which one we should use so for that i have made a small ppt to show you guys which command we should really use you can use any of these or you can go through the man of the date page and look for all the options you see all these options are there percentage a percentage b b which we were seeing as the full month name and things like that so it has lot 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 and options probably it's a very very confusing command but as and when needed you can refer the man page or maybe google and try to fit in according to your need i have prepared one slide and which i try to make it as generic as possible for some of this so let's go through this so now if you want to show the date in this format like date in the month day and year format so capital y is four digit year format so this is a two digit for month two digit for the day and four digit for the year if i run this command my day will date will display like this so which is good so that is one command to re remember the other command is time which we have already seen this displays only the time then this command is probably very important and why it is important i will go later on but first what it will display so if you give in this format it will be m is for two digit month day is for two digit day and h is for two digit hour m is for two digit minute so this is a capital m for minute a small m for month and y is four digit for year and there is a dot here followed by percentage s which is a two, two digit second now if i run this command the output would be like this which is 0, 05 which is two digit for month and then two digit for hour sorry day and then two digit for hour two digit for minute and then four digit for year followed by second so let's quickly run this command and why i want to run this command i will get back to you very soon so so first my date date is like this and then i will run this particular command percentage m percentage t percentage capital h percentage capital m percentage capital y dot percentage s now see so this is exactly the same as this of course the time will run like some second has been moved so ignore about that part because here it was 25 seconds here it is 45 seconds okay now so this is august 2nd which is here if you see here august 2nd and then we have the time is 15 59 which is in the afternoon 3 59 and then the year 2017 2017 and the number of seconds so this 25 is 45 because by the time i have typed 40 20 seconds already elapsed now this particular command can be used to set the date also how if you take this and just copy this now instead of august which is 08 i can say september now it has set why it is not because you have to run through sudo of course because you need a special privilege because you're setting the time of the system so i ran it and i will give my password done now if i run the command date you see it has changed to september 2nd it is no more august like this so this command is very useful so that's why i was saying that when the date is in this format you can display the date as like this and if you want to change some date you can change in this numeric value and just run the date command as in the next slide like this so if you want to run with some date so you say the date this is a small d mind it and then 08 which is august 02 which is day second day then this is time 1536 2017 and then this is second so this will set the date as august 2nd 1536 37 and whatever the default time zone is there it will take the default time zone there is a way to set the time zone also with percentage g options you can refer the man page so this is about date now date and time we have seen now there is a command called time but it is not in the usual sense we use this this time command is for altogether different purpose 
and that different purpose I can show you so let's suppose I have a cell script which I will create now I will go through all these concepts later on once all the commands complete but uh, just now I wanted to display something so I will show it to you so I have cell script bin bash and inside that I will say echo hello and then I will sleep for maybe two seconds and that's all now I say chmod 777 that is it now if I run this command with time this so any command you can run or any script or any binary you can run and prefix the time command so what this will do is it will run for two seconds which we have seen because we have a sleep for two seconds so now if you see here this in script execution took me two seconds so 2.08 so 8 milliseconds so two second and eight milliseconds now there's two more field one is a user and one is a system what is user and what the system is user means the time it has taken for the user base applications to execute so here it is very short script it didn't took anything because it's not so precise there are other ways to get more precise time uh, from hardware clock which is beyond the scope of this tutorial and you can also get it from the jiffies in the kernel if you want you can look in my youtube video for jiffies so we can get more precise time for this kind of small script but for big script which runs for considerable amount of time you will see some time years at least some millisecond so there is zero seconds spent for user space applications and system which mostly means in terms of kernel and low level things that also spends zero seconds for this if this is a very cpu intensive task probably these two might have differ different but this real time is always you look for how much time this is script takes. this real time is a sum of user space plus applications space plus everything so it's a summation of all the time which this script has taken to execute so this is altogether a different concept even though it sounds like time but it's not exactly system time or something like that it's the time for running how much time a script or a binary took to execute now when we were going for date and time which we were setting up locally mind it if you will be able to set up only when in ubuntu at least and in other things if you have these settings turn to manually if you try to say automatically whatever time and date you set it will get revert back almost immediately or maybe after some time so only when you set it to manually it will set the time whatever commands we were running with respect to date otherwise it will just revert and you will be confused oh i am setting why it's not allowing me so now i will re automatically revert back to internet and now if i run my date command so it's today january 2nd so you see i set the my time my date earlier to september something september 2nd 1559 now it's january 2nd 5 in the morning and my time zone is pst 2017 this is the time when i'm recording this video and time command is for a different purpose so thank you all for watching this video and i'll see you in the next video hello and welcome friend in this tutorial we will try to look at some of the options with respect to vi editor so the first thing i would suggest is go ahead and install vi in your system it's if it's not already been installed the command to get it installed is you could say sudo apt-get minus y installed vim as shown on the screen this command is only for ubuntu if you are working on some other distributions like fedora or red hat you will have to use yum or rpm if you have already downloaded with yum you could say something like yum space what provides vim and it will give you a list of options and which package has a vim and you can go ahead and install those package now once you're done since i have already done so i there's no point in doing it again and it says it's already done so we will directly open the vi editor and do some text manipulation so we can take this text itself and do some manipulation this i will treat it as a text and do some manipulation now what is vim and when we were saying vi then what is vim 
vi is the basic which uh, editor which used to come since 1976 or something when it was first written probably older than that and vim is an enhancement and then there is a gvim which is a gui vim but the underlying commands and everything works on vi but there are some enhancements in vim now there are two computing editors in the linux field one is emac and the vim i personally like vim because vi is very small it is found even in the embedded system very small system emacs are little heavy emacs probably has more customization feature compared to vi but it is not found at all the places so if you know vi then you you are sure that whichever server you logged in or whichever machine you logged in if there is at least one editor in that system that has to be vi so that's the reason i prefer vi over emac but it's up to your personal choice now the way you create a vi a file in vi is you say the command vi and even though you installed vim there is an alias created for vi so you use vi you might use vim also so you say vi and maybe my file.txt so what it will do is it will create this file this is a empty file now and you can go ahead and write there are two modes basic modes in vi one is a insert mode and the other is a command mode there is a third mode people say but it's actually the command mode itself it's an extension of the command mode so what does insert mode means that when you start typing something you have to be in insert mode the other is command so commands controls like deletion of a line and those kind of things so we will go through it shortly but first i will paste whatever i have so that i can show it to you now let's see i want to delete this line so the command to delete a line in vi is dd now if i say dd what it will do is it will delete so far so good now let's suppose i am in insert mode that means i am typing something i will tell you how you go to the insert mode so i am typing something if i want to delete this line so i said you just now to delete you say dd but what happens when you type dd it's actually writing on to a line it's not deleting so how does vi knows whether dd is meant to write the word or letter dd into a line or dd means you want to delete a line how does vi know that's the reason we distinguish between different modes so when in the insert mode that means in a writing mode insert mode is equivalent to writing or editing mode so when you are writing something and if you press dd that means you are writing dd the word dd the letter dd but if you want to go into a different mode you have to press escape escape is not visible so i pressed already now i already press escape so i am in a command mode when i am in command mode and if i press dd now this line is gone so the line is deleted so insert mode you can go to the insert mode by pressing i the letter i if you press i this is a insert mode so if if you are already in insert mode and if you press i it will just keep on writing i like this but if you press escape then that means you are in command mode now if you press i the i is not there so see it has struggled to the insert mode it will tell me that i have gone to the insert mode now if i press i it will write i so there is a small indicator here which will tell you in which mode you are remember this insert mode indicator might not happen in older vi also so their vi also has gone through many different revisions and not all vi has the similar kind of options although they all follow the same options in the sense the same basic options but some enhanced features or look and feel or maybe things like that displaying insert mode or displaying might not be available in all type of vi editors so good so we have seen two things one is insert mode so if you are saying insert so you have to press i then you go to the insert mode like this it will display you insert and then you can say i will write insert you have to achieve by pressing i and the other mode command mode you have to go by pressing 
escape so i will say escape so as soon as i press escape i go on. okay so that is about those two different modes now suppose i am in this line and i want to open a line after this so of course the command is o escape o because if i just press o that will write for me here because i am already there in the escape mode so if suppose if i am in the insert mode already means writing mode and i press o it will write o for me how does it knows it opens a line below this so no so what you have to do is you have to go to escape mode because you are issuing a command and then press o it will open a line below this line now if you want to delete this and this word like the package word so you have to go to the escape mode so you press escape and probably go to the cursor where you want to delete and say dw it will delete one word let's suppose we are in this line suppose line number line which says nine and i want to delete three words so already the new test so i would say escape three dw so whatever i have done is like this escape 3 dw so first you press escape keyword and then 3 w so it will delete that let's suppose i want to delete one character at a time so you go to the escape mode again and press x the letter x from your keyboard x like an x-ray and it will keep on deleting one letter at a time now let's suppose i want to copy this line building dependency tree so the copy command is called as yank and the short form is yy so it's called as yank yy so what you have to do is escape yy so that means you already copied now wherever you want to paste you come here and say escape p so you paste it so you see line number 7 and line number 14 are identical because i copied and pasted now let's suppose i want to delete everything after line 9 so maybe or i i want to delete five lines so i would say escape then 5 dd five lines would be deleted i want to revert whatever i deleted just now i would say escape u it's in revert mode i want to type something i want to write program then i will say escape and then i it, I went to the insert mode now I keep on writing so as long as I'm insert mode I can continue to write only from insert mode when you press the escape keyword it goes back to the command mode so now I am in insert mode so I would say hash include stdio.h blah 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 int main and I could say something like hello world I can write my programs like this continue no problem as long as you wish to the moment I press escape now I already press escape now if I press enter or something it comes down I cannot write the command because it will treat it as insert mode I already press I so that's why it went back to the insert mode so that's the way it works see about this hmm. now the other thing which I wanted to show you is like line number if you want to display the line number like this you have to say escape so since it's already being displayed i want to undo that so i would i would go to the escape mode and after escape i have to press colon so when after pressing escape and you type this special keyword colon it will show at the bottom of this screen but actually it's not by a part of editor so it's just in a command mode but it's in a special command mode that's why some people call it as a third mode but it's a command mode only a special case so escape colon and i would write set no no so no means not number so don't display the number so once you say set no no so see this set no no has not been written anywhere inside the editor it's just a way to say the command to the editor it's in the same screen you can do different kind of things based on the different mode you go now if you press here so see there is set menu there is nothing called as set no no anywhere now if i want to display the line numbers again i would say escape colon set and u this will display the line number let's suppose i want to search certain keyword so i would say escape then forward slash and the name of the keyword i would search for packages now 
I am searching for the keyword packages. Now you see here, it is matching here because I already have a setting in my VI which does a case insensitive. If I turn off the case insensitive, like case set no IC and see package is not found. So I will say escape where W E R E. If I try to search this, it says where not found, but where is there. But if I search for W E R E, it will say okay, where is found. And if I press N, it will take me to the next search. So how do I make case insensitive search? So I would say escape column set IC. IC means case insensitive. Now if I search for escape forward slash W E R E, so it will give me where it will take me to the character of the matching word first character of the matching word okay now let's suppose i am at this point and i want to join this line the line re1 with this brace closing brace so what should how do i join this i would say escape and then press shift j each time so i will write here each time i press shift j it moves one line from the bottom to up like this so this is the way i can do that now there is a line called reading and i want to replace certain characters so maybe d i want to replace with capital d so i would say escape then i would say shift r which is in a replacing mode and i would say then d so it will replace the letter d there now if I want to go to the end of this line, I would say escape shift A, shift A, the letter A for Apple. So it goes to the end of the line. I would go to the starting of, uh, so I, I would like to go to the beginning of line, escape shift pipeline. Pipeline is the letter pipeline like this. Escape shift pipeline. So this one. Of course you have to like when you are in this mode like how escape shift a which means that you have to press escape if you just say shift a how does it knows that it has to write the capital letter a or it has to go to the end of a line so you whenever you do some kind of operations with respect to command like going to the end of a line displaying a new line showing a number you have to be in escape mode only while writing you should be in insert mode when you are insert mode what it means is whatever you are typing that is just going literally typing on the screen that's not a command that is the main important thing which you have to remember now we have seen dd dw replace escape search shift j so the thing is in vi you really have to do a lot of practice and the more you practice the better you will be at it and after a few minutes or maybe after a few hours of practice, I'm pretty sure you'll be very comfortable and you will like it. It will be a most powerful editor. Now, let's suppose I would show you something like how powerful it is. So this is line number 10 and line number 10 escape YY I copied it and escape 100p. Now, if you see here, see, I have copied it 100 times in one single shot. Even if you use Notepad++ or any good editor, Sublime without proper macro or something i think it would be very hard to do this kind of operations so quickly now let's suppose i want to go to line number 55 i would say escape colon 55 the moment i say it takes me to the line number 55 now if i want to go to the bottom of this file escape shift g shift g will take me to the end of a file that will be the last line if i go want to go to the starting of file escape colon 1 because you remember colon and 10 will take me to the line number 10 so if i go and say escape colon 1 of course it will take me to the beginning of the file line 1 is the beginning of a file so you can do like that and let's suppose if i want to delete arbitrarily from 4 till the end of a file and I don't care it's a hundred line thousand line I would just say escape 1000 DD or one I, I have not pressed I think the entire number correctly so I say escape 1000 DD done everything is cleared the entire file is blank ex except for two if I would have done it here it would have been blank for 
everything so i will say escape 1000 dd the file is blank so i don't think you can achieve this much speed in any other editor and es es uh, except for emacs emacs is equally good but it is heavy and not found at all the places so i hope you enjoy this video try to practice as much as possible and only with the help of practice probably you would love vi otherwise you would be struggling with uh, cheap editors like pico ed those kind of editors which are really a good cell scripting guy or a good programming guy in unix will not like it a good person only likes either vi or emacs those are the only two good editors for programming and if you're using anything else i'm pretty sure you will never be counted as a geek or as a linux guy so it's your choice Thank you all for watching this video and you have a nice day. Bye-bye. Hello and welcome friend. In this tutorial, we will try to look at some more commands from the VI perspective. So in the last command, we have seen how to open a file and do some manipulations inside the file like yanking or copying of line and pasting it going to certain line numbers. Now, after doing all those operations, how do we save the file so that's the thing so either you open a blank file or create a new file so let's suppose i have this file file text onetxt so i will open this file so this file is already has some contents it's been saved in the past now let's suppose i add some contents here and i say hi this is shakil now if i change my mind and i don't want to save this and I want to quit with by without saving this line, the last line which I have added. So the command for that is you say escape, which you, you will be in command prompt, command mode. I mean to say escape column Q and then not. This not means you forcefully exit, even though I have the changes. So if you don't press not, and if you have the changes, it will say no, you have a changes, you cannot quit. When I say not, it means yes, I have a changes here, and I want to discard that. So you just exit it will exit now if i open it again my change is gone because it has quit without savings now let's suppose if i want to write and save so i write something hi this is new line and i want to save it so the for saving you have to say escape colon wq and not is again forcefully that you save it if you don't give not then also it is fine but I generally practice like this escape colon WQ not and then this will force if I open it again you see this is still maintained this line has been saved so far so good now this is file one now how about doing multiple file operations within the same VI editor the way you open multiple tabs you can do very much similar uh, in notepad with tabs so you can do it in VI also so right now the file if you see here is file text one if you see the file name you want to see the file name you say escape colon e it will display you the file name or you can say escape colon f it will show you the file name now i want to open another file so what you do is escape colon e and then you say another file i have another file here test one so here see this is file one it says when i open another file this is called as this is file two so i have another file now if I want to go back, so I will do some manipulation here. I have changes in file two and I can save it. So if you just want to save without quitting the VI editor, you can say W. But if you want to save and quit, you have to say WQ. So that's the only difference. Only save is like W and save and quit is WQ. So that's the way you do it now this is file 2 i save this contents in the file 2 but i don't want to quit now i want to go back to my other file which was file 1 so going back to the file 1 there is a command called escape colon bn so n means next file so you keep on pressing next file so now this is file 1 so we were in file 2 when we press b1 we came to file 1 again you press and then it will go to file 2 again again escape colon bn so bn means next file if you have n number of files you keep on iterating and it will overlap and then come back to the first file again there are individual commands like bf escape colon bf go to the first file bl go, go to the last file but you don't need to remember everything because 
most of the time we do iterations over five six files and it's very easy to do bn and anyway it will wrap over and when it reaches the end of the file the last file and if you press bn it will go and pick the file first file again so you don't remember need to remember everything just the bn so escape colon bn is the next file now sometimes you might need to split your terminal into two halves and see compare some files so for splitting there is a command called escape sp so, so uh, sorry i was not in escape mode so escape colon vsp so there is a sp and vsp i would go for vsp because vsp is vertical split and sp is horizontal split so i don't like horizontal split but you can try so v is vsp and sp split so if you see here now when you split they will have the same content right because it's the same file you see so if you want to open another file in another window you can just go so first you have to cycle between this window and this window so to cycle between those windows okay now if you want to move back and forth between those two uh, tabs you say control w w so it will move to this tab then again you say control w w it will come back to this tab control w w okay so that way you can do a changes now in this like li right now both the tab is having the same file test2 two, test2 two. in this tab suppose you want to open a file test1 so escape colon e and then you say test1.txt so this is test1 then this is control w w you can go here and this is test2 and you can do some sort of modifications or whatever changes also note that in some of the older vi the left and right arrow for going in a file like this or up and down will not work so there is this keyword j and k so if you want to go move down you have to press j in from the keyboard and of course you have to be in escape mode and k is up so i'm pressing j and k now j means down k means up is up and h and l h is move left and l is right so you just remember h and l they are in positions left and right and j and k is down and up so so this is j down k is up so this is the way you can manipulate files and there are a lot of commands with respect to vi so you will really have to practice now one more thing if i want to undo certain changes like this change was done so i would say escape u it will do undo and i will press as long as i wish to before saving because i have already saved it so it will not undo that but if i write something like let's suppose i write this 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 and i want to undo escape u i will press it will undo that so that's the way you can do and then there is a redo command and control r you can do those kind of things so in fact there are lot and lot of options but you don't need everything you just need some limited set the but the main thing is you have to practice so thank you all for watching this video and i hope to see you in the next video thank you hello and welcome friend in this lecture we will try to look at some of the linux and unix file system permissions so there are two basic commands for changing the ownership and permissions and we will try to look one of them which is ch mode change mod so change mode basically alters the permissions of a file there is a change owner which we will cover in subsequent videos change mode as we know is for changing the file permissions typically when you create any file and if you look the file permissions with the help of command like ls minus la or ls minus l which is a long listing in ls and you will see the permissions like this what this means is that this bit is read this bit is write and this bit is execute so that's what i have mentioned here r is for read w is for write which is a modification permission is granted a user or a group or other if they have the w permissions which means that they have the permissions to modify the contents of a file or they can delete the file x means execute permissions which means that they can run that binary or a program or a script file so they have sufficient privilege to run
Now, if we look more closely here, I have separated by a space. Typically, this is not separated by space, uh, but I just separated by space for clarification. So if you look here, first three bits. So this is first bit, second bit, third bit. So this first three bits are for permissions for user. And mind it, this permissions denotes it's a file. If there is a D here, which means it's a directory. So we will not cover this. This just signifies whether this is a file or a directory so when we say first bit we really means from here not from here so first third three bits are for users then the subsequent three bits are for the group so this three bit if you see here group has only read access they don't have write or execute access and the last one is for others other means anyone apart from user and group so this is a concept called user and group user is a user as we all know a user present in the system and there are set of groups a group means a set of people with some responsibility like administrator can be one group printer pool or a printer admin can be another group things like that so typically whenever we create a user we create a corresponding group also so if i create a user john i will create a group called john so anyone who belongs to group john so there might be a user called mike he might also belongs to the group john and john is also a user john is a group and mike is a different user but he belongs to the user group so whatever permission is there in group john mike will also have those permissions as part of the group so if you belong to a group whatever permissions belong to that group you will by default get that permissions so that's what group means and other means this field last three bit is for other which means that you don't belong to the user you don't belong to the group so you are none of them so that permission denotes whatever permissions you have now if we look here more closely it is like this so first three bits are for user and within that first three bit first bit is read then the next subsequent bit is write and then third bit is execute then here fourth bit is again write for the group fifth bit is sorry read for the group fourth bit is read for the group fifth bit is write for the group and sixth is again execute for the group and then seventh is for read for the others eight is for write for the others and ninth is the execute bit for the others if we look at the numerical value the value of r here whatever the r we have seen here the numerical value of r is four so let me go back and the numerical value of w is two and the numerical value of execute bit is one so if you sum up 4 plus 2 plus 1 is equals to 7. So any user or group or others, they can have a max permission of 7. That's a numerical donation. Now if you look here, we have full permission in this particular case. I am just giving you a hypothetical case. So it's read, write, execute. And so this is 4 plus 2, 6 plus 1, 7. So this is 7 and again this read write execute so this is 4 plus 2 plus 1 which is 7 4 plus 2 plus 1 7 7 7 7 here I am demonstrating the same thing again just a little bit more clarity so in this particular file it has only write permissions I am sorry it has only read permissions so R is for read and then two blanks means no permission so the equivalent is zero so read as we know has a value of four if we can look in our previous slide read has a value of four so this is four zero zero four zero zero four zero zero so which means the effective permissions if we want to modify by a numerical system it would be four 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 now if i give read but no write permissions and execute so which is four and there is no write so it is zero and then execute bit is one again execute bit is value is one then again this is only read four zero zero if we look the permissions here so this has only one bit as four and the last bit as one 
for user so this becomes 5 so you can add this 5 and then 400 is 4 and 400 so the effective permissions would be 544 here it is 4 plus 2 plus 1 which is 7 and then no permissions for users or group or others sorry no permissions for group and others this is 00 so let's try to look at some of the examples with respect to the users and permissions so we will create a file default file and we will try to run through some of our examples so let me touch a file touch is one command which, which you can create a empty file a blank file so i will say file one dot txt or i could have given any name now if i look with ls minus l this file the default permissions is rw rrr so rw is r is 4 write is 2 and execute bit is not set for user so this is user then for group only read permissions is there so uh, which is 400 0, 0. and then again for others it's 400 0, 0. so if we sum up the effective permissions would be this 4 plus 2 is 6 and then this is 6 and this is 4 this is 4 so 644 4 would be the effective permissions so if I want to change the permissions by numerical systems I could say 644 4, which is ineffective I am doing the same thing same permissions no change but just I want to demonstrate now let's suppose if I change the permissions to something else like 777 I give all the permissions to all the users group and others and now if I look with ls minus l you see rwx rwx everything is populated which means it has got all the permissions. now if I want to go back to the previous permissions so we know previously the permissions were 644 so if I just say 644 it will take me back to the previous permissions so I can now again see 644 is this so 777 means all permissions to users group and others now 777 looks good many times that if you want in a hurry and you want to give some execute permissions you don't want to calculate you just end up giving 777 but that might be a security hole that might be causing security problems so make sure you know when you give more permissions than needed so make sure you know what you are doing now this numerical way of assigning and giving the permissions is very good but at the same time there are other commands which you would like to quickly see so now you see here others doesn't have permissions except for read so let's suppose for others which is denoted by o i want to give a write and execute permission so i will say o wx file one dot txt now if i look for the file one now I will see that for others write and execute permission is granted earlier it was only read permissions were there but write and execute was not there but now with this command other plus write and execute I can give I can in the similar way I can take away the permissions with the minus denotations minus means you just take away the read uh, write permissions which is modifications and permissions and execute permissions now if I look at the file here again, again it has been taken off. So this is with others. Same thing we can do with user. Same thing we can do with group. So let's try to do with group. So group we have removed the permissions of write and execute. If I look the file at now, file one, this has been, so this we have removed. So user group. So group there were no permissions earlier there were only read permissions which we can read and we have removed the permissions with respect to write and execute which was not there so something which is not there and you remove it doesn't make sense it doesn't matter it will remain the same let's suppose there is a permissions here so we will add the permissions first and then we will remove let's suppose for group we will add the permissions write and execute now if i look here so for group it is write and execute permissions are both granted and if I remove want to remove it I can say minus and if I look here so I will see that the permission is gone this permissions were there which I have granted and then it is gone so this is just when you add it or subtract it now if you want to have effective permissions you don't care what permissions was there earlier I just want to give read and execute permissions so you can say group equals to read and execute 
and what it will do is it will just set up the group permissions as read and execute so see read and execute write permissions are not there if i give g equals to wrx so it will set the right permissions so this is the way you can set uh, users permissions and for group and others so there are a couple of other things with respect to sticky bit and set uid and umass which i will cover in the subsequent video so thank you all for watching this video and you have a nice day hello and welcome friend in this lecture we will try to look at some of the chmod command which we have left in the previous session so we will continue that and then we will look into change of ownership which is chown command and there is another command for changing the group which is ch group so we will try to look at some of this command so we have already gone through change mode to change the different type of permissions with respect to user group and others for read write and execute permissions so let's look at a typical file and we see that here in this particular file if we see here we have all the permissions read write and execute for users and then for groups read write execute and again for others read write and execute so far so good now if we look here there is a directory here for a file it is okay but for directory suppose if we want to change the permissions of that directory as well as all the subsequent contents inside that so if you look at this test directory it ha it is a directory which means d and then it has read write execute permissions for user for group it is only read and execute no write permissions so let's suppose for group i want to give the write permissions as well as for group i want to give the, sorry for as well as for others i want to give the write permissions i can do it on the top level directory if i go inside this directory there are other contents there are sub contents folders that will not be allowed to get the permissions if i give the top level folder so let's try this by giving the top level folder 777 to this test now let's look at the permissions ls minus l for test and if you want to see just the contents the directory permissions you can say ls minus ld now you see ls minus ld test directory we can see that it is read write execute all the permissions has been granted for the test directory but test directory inside the test directory there is a directory one two three and then there is some file those permissions are not changed those permissions are still same to double very sure and verify we can go inside the directory and see you see this is still not have the right permissions for this so if you want to do that there is a command called recursive permissions and the way recursive permissions work is minus r so if you apply that on the top level folder it keeps on going recursively till whatever nested level you have all the files and folders so once we give this and we of course test folder will be having the right permissions if you see here test folder it got the right permissions and let's get inside this and see everything get all the permissions so the command is ch mode minus r777 and even inside one folder one if you go there will be another subsequent folders those permissions are applied to those folders also so minus r means recursive now if you look into the permissions here for any files or folders you see there are two fields so this is a permissions field and then this we have already seen that how many links are there which we have seen in some of the previous video now this is user and then this is a group now if i want to change the group or maybe i have a special privilege some kind of administrative task group so i want to make this particular file a part of some group i can change that so there is a command called change group with change group you have to specify and i have a group called mike so mind it this you belongs to user shakil but there is a user mike as well as group mike so i want to change the group mike for this particular file called file 3 and since mike i is a different user different group i cannot just assign the group to mike so i have to say sudo now if i run this command here 
plus minus L, you see this was belonging to Shakil, user Shakil, group Shakil. Now it is user Shakil, but group belongs to Mike. So this belongs to my group. So whatever permissions my group has, this file will automatically inherit those permissions. This is another way to change the group ownership. And with that, you can change group and the user both. So let's suppose I have another user called John in my system. So the command is like this, ch own. And then you have to say user John and then you want to change the group also change so from mike i will change to john from shaquille also i will change to john so both user and group will change and this is for file 3 and i have to give sudo because john is a different user and right now i am logged in with user shaquille so i need a special privilege now let's look at the permissions this is belonging to John and John. So earlier we started with Shakil and Shakil. Shakil is a user and then Shakil is a group. Here John is a user and John is a group. And we could have it differently. Maybe John, Mike or Mike, John. We could do it in either way. So let's suppose we will do it. We can change it to Mike and John. And now if I look here, it will be Mike and John, two different things. So we can change the group ownership like this. If we want to do it recursively, there is an option called minus R, similar to ch more recursive option. So it will apply for all the files and folders. So let's suppose if I try to apply the same thing into a top level folder called test here. And if I apply test and let's suppose if I go here inside the test, you see everything got changed. But OK, I think I didn't apply the minus R options. Let me do it again. I'm sorry. So let's apply the minus R options, which is recursively. Let's go inside the test folder and you see everything belongs to Mike and John. Everything was Shaquille and Shaquille, except for one which we have changed. Now everything belongs to Mike and John. So if you want to change the ownership recursively, you have to apply minus R option. Change group options. If you need to change group chgrp with some group name for the files or folder name you can do that and of course you have to do sudo because you have to be a super user to run this command and but you can live with change ownership so change ownership is more than sufficient if you want to look in the system what all the users and groups are present there's a command called get ent and if you want to see the user you have to type password and it will list out all the password so if you see one more thing and some of you who are aware that this is nothing but the contents of etc password so you can directly open in the vi and etc password and you can look inside the contents so this is exactly the same content so get ent password will tell you all the users present in the system by fetching the data from etc password and get ent group will get all the groups in the system and this is again similar to etc group so this is the etc password which is for all the users and etc group which is for all the users for all the groups so this is the same command which fetches the data from the etc group so these are the two commands which you you might need to look at some of the groups and users in the system so thank you all for watching this video and i'll see you in the next video. hello friend what's up uh, we will try to look into some of the concepts like no hang up background jobs foreground jobs and killing a job in this video so i have a small cell script don't worry we will go into this kind of scripts later on in much more details but as of now i wanted to show you this so there is a variable called count which is set to zero in slice to zero and then here if you see it's a hash not it's a standard way of saying hash not bin bash so this is my shell which i want to execute if i want to execute in some other cell instead of bin bash i would have said c shell csh or sh which is a bound shell or ksh which is a con shell but we will be doing on bash shell now there is a while loop which is an infinite while loop it doesn't have any condition to exit out and it will just increment a count echo that count to a file so we will not take it to a file for the time being we will just 
show it onto a screen and it will sleep for one second and then do it continuously so let's try to run this command now when once i run this command you see that every one second it prints a number starting from zero so it's in increments to one and prints it and it keeps on doing continuously now if i press enter i'm pressing enter now you see i'm not getting my prompt back my shell prompt like dollar sign back this is because my job is running in a foreground it has occupied the terminal i cannot type another command until this finishes and this will never finish because it's an infinite loop so you will come across a situation wherein you are doing a download of a file using wget or maybe using scp and you are blocked with a terminal and you are not able to and maybe you don't want to open another terminal so what to do so this is a command called control z i will write here control plus z so control z don't type the keyword plus it's a control and z like this so you press control and z what it will do is it will push your job to a background and stop it so what it means is it is no more running it's in a stopped state the operating system takes its state wherever it is running it has last printed at 48 or 49 whatever and it will keep it like it's in a frozen state and when it resumes from there it will start back from 49 or 50 or whatever it was interrupted at and it will not start from the beginning so once you do that once you press ctrl z you will get your shell back you can run another command right so now what you can do is you can run whatever you wish to and you can push your command in the background so when you push your command in the background what this effectively means is you can get your prompt back so let's do it with example and with bg you have to give an argument which is a job number and this is percentage one so you can run the command jobs so it will tell you what is the job there can be n number of jobs like we have run test there can be so many other things we could have run simultaneously so it will be job one two three four so on and so forth so when you run like this you can push it to a background by saying bg percentage one if you don't give any argument by default it will be one which is only one job but if there are multiple jobs then you will have a problem so we'll have the right habit of giving the job number now you see here it starts outputting from 49 so it was interrupted at 48 here and then it started from 49 50 51 and if i press enter i get my shell prompt back i can still run some command i can run ls minus l don't worry if for the screen getting garbled because on the steady out your ls command output is also coming and at the same time whatever the count is increasing that is also giving but you can run another command so one good thing is you got it unblocked but if you don't want this behavior that the screen gets garbled in your shell script you could have redirected to a file here we are just redirecting on to a study out to demonstrate and if i say jobs so it's one jobs running if i want to kill this job i could say kill percentage one and it would terminate that job so now you see there's no more coming onto a screen so there is a kill command then there is a foreground job fg brings to a front so if something is in a background it will bring it to a front so right now the jobs are stopped there is no jobs let's run it again so if i run it again test.sh it is coming control z it is pushed and stopped so remember when it is pushed to the background and stopped it is not running only if you make it to the background it will run but this is stopped plus push to a background now if i say fg percentage one which is job number then it is coming to a forefront i cannot get my prompt back see again it is the same situation so again i press ctrl z but if i want to run it without blocking my prompt without blocking my terminal ability to type another command i can say bg percentage one so which means it's running in the background but it is not taking not blocking my terminal i can still type another command so now here i can type another command ls minus l i know this is a little bit confusing but once you practice you will get to know about all this foreground background so i will just kill this job now so this one more thing if you want to run any command 
in the background in a sense without blocking you you could say ampersand so if i run like this you see i get my prompt back even though things are coming to a steady out but the jobs are running if you want to kill it you can say kill percentage one or when you are writing like this and it's an annoyance you could redirect to some file so your script should be redirected to a file called logger.txt now if you run here you see it is running you are not getting the prompt back and nothing comes on the screen the reason everything is going to a file so i stop this so stop in a sense i terminated it now let's run it into a background with ampersand sign now this is running if you look with the process id yes minus if is used to look into a particular process whether it's running or not we will cover this in subsequent chapter so don't worry about this but for the time being i am trying to demonstrate that it is running so if you can see there is a process id associated with this test.sh so it is running even if you look into a back into a log file where it is outputting its data see it is continuously coming out and it's running so it's out outputting the contents to this file and if i go with the jobs the job is running if i say kill percentage one which is this job it is terminated and if i run jobs again there is no job and if i try to look into this logger file it is no more progressing it's just hang there because there's no more contents coming into it the job got terminated so thank you all for watching this video and i will see you in the next video we will try to look into some of the wildcard and regex thanks hello and welcome friend in this tutorial we will look at two commands which are called as short and the other command is unique so short command is used for sorting a file based on certain conditions so there are different options which you can pass to short and we will look at some of the options which we frequently encounter so i have a file called fruit list in which i have written the name of some of the fruit so this is just this apple with a capital a and apple with a small a then orange banana lemon and lemon is duplicate here watermelon grapes now i want to sort this file by default sorting happens based on ascii or you can say based on dictionary type of sorting that a comes before b and b comes before c those kind of things so it's a ascii or you can say dictionary format sorting now let's try to sort this file so we have seen if i do a cat for this file this is the listing and default with no options if you do a sort it's a dictionary sorting it would look like this so if you see here it is apple capital a was first but here small a comes before capital a and then banana grapes lemon orange now if you see here lemon is a duplicate so in sorting i can give pass an option which is minus u and it will remove a duplicate so if i sort it again you see this time lemon appears only one so there are other number of options in sort you can go through the man pages of the sort and if you have something like human readable or case insensitive like human numeric sort or maybe case insensitive kind of things ignore case you could pass those options so you can refer to whenever it's needed but this is very generic one which we use many times to remove the duplicate maybe sort now this is with respect to a file which is having some text what if we want to do some numerical sorting so i have a file called file number and the content is like this so it is again randomized so there is no order in this now if i want to sort this file so let's see how it goes so let me just do a cat for this file so that we can refer into the screen so my cat is this now if i do a normal sort and you will see that it will do a ascii sorting which is not what i want if i want in ascending or descending order so ascii sorting will not work for me so if you see i do a sorting which is ascii sorting so zero which is okay but 10 and after that minus 100 so this is not right so if i want to do numeric sorting so i have to say 
sort minus n minus n is for numeric sorting and you say minus number now if you see here it is sorted in ascending order so minus 500 is the lowest followed by minus 100 0 10 20 30 40 and so on now what if i want to do a descending order so which is a reverse sort so i can do a reverse sort and see it is just a reverse so starting with the highest keeps on lowering and going to the lowest now let's suppose i have two file and i want to sort so this is file number and i have one more file called as file number one so let me show the contents of file number one to you guys and sorry it's a file number two now this is another file which is having some decimal points and this is also not sorted what if i want to sort file number and file number two together so the syntax for this is you can say sort and you can say n which is numeric and you can give multiple files so you can say u and then followed by numeric file one number one and number two so what it will do is it will concatenate both the files together and it will sort in the ascending order if you want in a descending order you could have given r which is reverse so it will do a reverse sort so this is about sorting now the other command which i have told you is unique unique is to give a unique number so let's suppose in the fruit list i have this lemon appearing twice we could we we have removed this with sort with minus u right so that is okay if i could say just sort minus u we removed it that's appearing once but what if i don't want to do a sort but i just do a unique so there is a command called unique and that command is like this 52 uniq so mind it it's not unique it's uniq if you cat a file and pass unique what it will do is it will take the subsequent characters so if lemon appears twice it will make it unique now here is the catch what if in this the lemon appears somewhere else also suppose the lemon appears at three places now what if you will do now what you see here is those two lemons which were appearing together unique has made it unique but the one which was standing single unique has not made it unique so in those kind of things what you might want to do is for sort and then pipe to unique if needed so let's suppose i could have done fruit list so which is a sorting so which will arrange like three lemons and then i can pass it to sort so i pipe to sort in the sense we can so i'm sorry pipe to unique because we are already doing a sort so pipe to unique it will make the lemon unique so here when we do a sort and then there were three lemons and then after sorting i said unique and it makes one lemon so unique is a command which make things unique but it has to be appear adjacent to each other if it is not adjacent to each other unique will not work so in that case what you do is for sort so that related things are together and then you apply unique so that's all for this video and i i hope to see you in the next video thank you very much for watching hello and welcome friend in this tutorial we will try to look at two commands one is stop and the other is ps process status and these two command will come handy while debugging a shell script maybe sometimes your script is written in some bad ways it consumes too much cpu or maybe something is consuming more cpu and you want to debug your system so that comes very handy so there is this command top so by default when you run the top command it will not return you the prompt back and it keeps on continuously running it's like windows task manager if you want to come out of this top command if you press enter it will not come out so what you have to press is q q means come out quit so let's run it again if you look at the top command the first few lines four five lines it will give you some system details and then it will give you the individual process details so it will say you up time for how many days and hours the system is up how many users are there and then there is the concept of load average load average is average calculated over a period of time and says how much your system is busy 
and then how many tasks are running sleeping stop zombie you might have to read some of those concepts then here is interesting field called percentage cpu right now it's like 3.8 5.8 it's less suppose this percentage cpu goes to 70 percent 80 percent and the system becomes consistently very busy and it will be low in performance then this is a memory i have approximately 3 gb of memory and this is a swap space so this is my swap space like approximately 4 gb and how much is the free how much i am using and how much is the available now the next sections in this top command will give you pid pid is process identifier each process which runs in the system will have a unique identifier it's like to identify the process uniquely you can refer from the kernel perspective from the user's perspective you can kill it's a it's kind of a name but not exactly name name is binded to the process id but process id is a unique identifier now you see here this is a pid then who is running those processes users then there is a priority field then virtual memory couple of other fields how much shared memory resident memory and then for individual process like console process is consuming 1.7 percentage cpu it is taking like 2.1 percentage of memory which is this memory and time and commands so this is the way you run it now sometimes what happens is you are debugging something you want to tra get a trace log and you want to get the output of top in your script or maybe from your script you run top but if you run from your script the top command it will just hang there so top has an option called batch mode in minus b and you can give how many iterations you want to do so top keeps on running so you can give the iteration one means only run only once two means run two times and gives the output and batch mode means it will not hang the way we were seeing it that it will not block the console it will just relieve it so now if you run here you see i got my prompt back which means top command ran executed and prompt so this way i can take it output to some file.txt and i can see the output later on so you can use top in this way to get an output to a script for debugging the other command is called ps process status another very interesting and very important command so by default when you run ps there's an option called ef which means that you show all the process in the system and let's pipe it to more i want to see one page at a time because there are many more options many pages to display so in the process the first field is uid which is a user identification which means which user is running these processes and this is root so if you keep on going down there might be other users which is running this process so let's go back again and then for this process what is the pid this is my init process which will always have the pid one this is my parent process id tty time and what is the exact command it is running now if you see here this field is limited it can go up to this much width so sometimes the command is very big and it might not show all the options so in ps there is an options called as ps aux www you have to remember this and if you run this it will show you more details and exact command line options which you used to run this particular command so ps will be very very handy so by default if you see here ps has those three fields pid so and mind it for each ps options your heading and everything will change so there's a lot of formatting options which you can use with ps you have to, you can go through the man page for ps it's not possible to show you all the details because ps has probably more options much more options than all the combined commands put together in windows it has that many options so let's see if ps you run it with minus ef you will see that uid pid and ppid those are the three fields if you run ps with minus elf e and l caps this l means you show all the threads then you will see that there is that uid pid ppid and then there is the lwp which is a lightweight process 
in Linux threads are called as lightweight process so it will tell you the thread identifier also so that way you can run ps so you have to practice ps and top and if you have some doubts probably do google search in the forum look into the man page but i'm pretty sure those two commands if you are making a career in unix or linux top and ps will help you a lot for debugging knowing where the problem in the system is and those kind of things so thank you all for watching this video and i hope to see you in my next video you have a nice time bye what's up friend in this tutorial we will try to look at the concept of redirection and pi in linux and unix so the first thing is what is a file descriptor so you will come across this concept and terminology many times so file descriptors are integer numbers in linux and most of the unix distributions which represent a kernel data structure to associate a unique file with a corresponding integer numbers so what it means is by default the system will assign one integer number to each of the file you open and with that integer number you can do any kind of operation so if any one of you have done some system programming or c programming they will know what is the return value of the open system call open so when we do the cell script cell script is also basically nothing but a wrapper on top of all the system calls so cell script also use a system call so which means they use the similar terminology so that is the file descriptor and we will look how we can use this now as i said that file descriptors are associated with the open file so by default the system creates three global file descriptors one is zero which is steady in standard input so if you type some input from the keyboard like let's suppose your program asks for some input enter how many vegetables or how many quantity of fruits you need so you enter some number and when you're typing those on terminal so there is a file descriptor associated with that that terminal input goes to the variable you are using read or some variable it will go into that excuse me <coughs> so similarly there is a steady out when you say echo hello and you see on the terminal the keyword hello getting printed so how it gets printed how does it knows that it has to be printed on this terminal and not maybe on some other terminal so it associates a steady out descriptor for that terminal and the last is std error so just to differentiate between std out and std error sometimes there are a lot of std out like logs files might be outputting onto a terminal and then simultaneously there are some errors that also gets output onto a terminal you will not be able to distinguish between std out and std error only if they have a different file descriptor so that's why we have a different file descriptor for std error now apart from these three you can create your own file descriptor but these are the three standards so if you open a file you will not get a file descriptor as zero you will get only starting from three because zero one and three are always reserved for any process so those three std out std in std err are always reserved now let's see some of the redirection thing so if you look redirection greater than sign it means that redirect to a file or std out now std out is also treated as a file because it has a file descriptor associated so we will say it's redirect to file or std out similar when it's a less than which means you input from a file input means user input some data by hand by manually typing onto the keyboard and when we have less than less than which means that you append rather than overwrite and similarly for greater than greater than which means whatever output is there in a file you are outputting to a file so you don't each time overwrite with the new content what you do is you just keep on appending at the end of the file so in terms of numerical values whatever we have shown like greater than sign so when we say one greater than file name now we know that one is associated with std out so remember zero is std in one is std out two is std error so when we say one greater than file name which means redirects std out to a file name 
and then this is the same thing but it's a append so which means you keep on adding at the bottom of a file or std out even though for std out it doesn't make sense because once you have thrown an output to a screen it doesn't make sense because that will still be visible whether you append or you just overwrite but for a file it does make sense because suppose you have outputted hello world into a file and the next time you are outputting as here redirection maybe hi there so hi there will overwrite hello world so when you open the file you will see hi there hello world is gone but if you use greater than greater than which is an append so if you open the file you will see hello world and then on below line you will have hi there so which means it's an append mode same thing here with two so two is std err file descriptor and so two greater than file name means redirect std error to a file name and when we have this special symbol called ampersand greater than file name it means redirect both the std err std out to a file name so everything whatever is there just redirect to some file name then there are another important concept called as dev null so dev null is a special character device which is default created in the system and the useful of this dev null is like it's like a black hole any data which goes to a dev null is lost so why do we need it sometimes you want to discard some data like for example you want to kill a process but it might happen many times that process is already being killed or doesn't exist so when a process doesn't exist and you want to kill it it will throw some error and you don't want to show those error messages in those kind of places what you do is you redirect the kill value kill minus 9 or minus int with some process id and redirect to dev null which means even if the process doesn't exist it will not throw you the ugly message that process does not exist or pid doesn't exist so now let's go through some of the examples which we have discussed now so let me do the first thing so let's do a basic command ls minus l which we all know gives you the listing of a file or directory so i have this listing now if i want to take it into a file so as i said by default this goes into std out because you are able to see which is standard out it's coming to a terminal so it shows on terminal if i want to take it into a file so i will say file name.txt any file name.txt now you see imagine after this there is no output onto a screen everything went into a file so if i open this file with the vi and you will see that i have this contents listed so everything whatever was thrown on to the std out goes to a file so far so good now let's suppose i want to create an empty file so this is when some output is going to a file if i want to create an empty file i can say file name or maybe something file name one because file name already exists so i say greater than now if i look into this there will be a file name one which is empty file zero size so there is this shorthand notations if you want to get rid of all the contents from a file you can just say greater than file name and it will create if you want to do for this file it will just remove the content if it's if the file doesn't exist it will create a new file like this so this is about file name now let's suppose we already have this file name so let's open this file name again which we have created with the listing and the end line if you see has a file called test9 now let's suppose what we do is we echo something echo hello maybe and then we say greater than greater than which means append so what append means is whatever is content is there in the file name don't overwrite just on the new line write one more hello and by default echo prints into a new line so if you do like this and try to open a file what it will do is it will say hello uh, with all the other contents remaining as it is now what would happen if you just say with a single right and maybe hello one two three now if you open the file you will see that only this is there so this is no more in append mode so single greater than is just write whatever is there onto this file so it will overwrite everything double greater than means it's an append so whatever is there just preserve and write at the bottom of the file so that's the difference between append now let's suppose when we were doing this command ls minus l it was printing into the std out and when then we used to take it into file suppose 
we don't need this information we might be doing some operations and we don't need to see this because you are running it as a cell script so you might say redirect to dev null so it just goes to a dev null and it vanishes and mind it if you look into a dev null it's not a regular file but it's a character device so a c in the beginning means it's a system character device it doesn't have size it has a minor number and a major number for device operation so what it means is this cannot be getting full so don't expect that oh if you put so too much contents into dev null it might get filled or something like that no it will never get filled and you can dump the data as fast as possible maybe tons and tons and gbs of data per second it will never get filled so just for knowing you will never be filling up the, those much data but i just wanted to point out that this data will never get filled so you can put or push as much data into dev null and it will always be discarded the other thing is let's suppose i wanted to do something like this ls minus l and i want to check if a file 1 2 3 4 5 exists or not so you see this file doesn't exist and ls tells me oh no such file or directory so what this effectively means is this message which gets printed on the screen is coming to std err not std out so even though it is outputting onto a terminal on your console on your xterm that doesn't means this message is coming to std out so this message is coming to std err now let's suppose if i try to take this message into a new file file 123.txt suppose and you see it has not gone to the file but it is still coming onto the screen but previously when we tried to take ls it all went to a file so why it is not going to a file and it's coming to a screen the reason when you redirect like this that means only std out goes to a file but this message is printing on std err so a std err is not redirected to a file so you can do this redirections by saying okay so redirect to a file so ls minus l test and then you can say to greater than ampersand 1 so what 2 greater than ampersand 1 means 2 is stdrr so what you are saying ok put everything to a file but you also put stdrr to 1 so stdrr to std out so first you redirect from stdrr to std out which is your current terminal and then output everything to this so remember ls gives the output to std out but only when there is an error it sends to str now if you do like this you see there is no error shown onto the screen but if you open the file you can see this error message so this is the way you can tap and how do i know that this is an error message okay so let's look at the error message command so after every execution of a command there is a success or failure message which a shell prints for you provided the command supports it in this particular case you can see this error message by echo dollar question mark now you see whenever the file doesn't exist or is there is any error it will give you a number which is non-zero anything apart from zero is a error message so here it gives you a non-zero message too which means this is an error and this throws to std err now if i suggest ls minus l which means it's a generic ls minus l it prints out everything in that particular current directory and if i do echo dollar question mark after that it zeros which means it's a success so that's why all these messages which it prints as part of listing of the file it's printing on std out terminal so remember there is std out and std error both prints onto a terminal and then there is std in which takes the input from the terminal so we will look for more of these concepts in our next part so thanks for watching this video and you have a nice time what's up friend we have saw some of the redirections in our last tutorial and in this we will try to look at some of the redirections in more details so the first command which we will run is exec now exec is a shell inbuilt command in the sense it's not an extra binary or utility which supplements the shell functionality but it's part of the actual core source code of the shell 
So exec spawns a new process. It's similar to fork. If some of you are aware of uh, system calls fork in C, but exec differs slightly, which we will not go into the details. So as of now, the only thing you can consider about exec is exec spawns a new shell or spawns a new process if it needs to run some command by default. But if you don't give any command and if you give a number, integer number, so what it does is it does a redirection of the entire shell. So you have opened one terminal and there is a shell associated with terminal bin bash. And when you say exec like this, so what it means is it opens a file descriptor three and it redirects all the contents to that file name. So which means anything which writes to file descriptor three goes to a file. So we have seen std in which is zero, std out one, std error two. But where is this three coming from? Three is users. So zero, one, two is created by system. Three, four, five, six, as many numbers as you wish to. There are some limits, so we will not go into that limit. But you can create all those other file descriptors you wish. So let's go and run a quick example what I mean by that. So this is my terminal and then of course there is a shell associated because whenever you open a terminal there is a bash running inside that because terminals are associated with a bash. Okay, so now let me run one quick command and I will say exec 3 and less than greater than and I will say mylog.txt. So our, I will say now echo hello. Now if you see hello, hello is coming to a screen it's not going to a log file had it been going to a log file it would have not printed on the screen why it's not going to a log file because we are redirecting three when by default when you say echo hello echo hello goes to std out but we are not redirecting std out to a log file we are redirecting file descriptor three which doesn't have any name because only zero one two has a specific name now let's suppose i write the same command echo hello and I say greater than ampersand 3. What this means is whatever I am typing here, it should be redirected to file descriptor 3. Now when it is going to file descriptor 3, we have already set up our redirection that whatever comes to file descriptor 3, put it to a log file. Now when we run this command, you see there is nothing coming on to output onto a screen. And if I see my log file, the log file has the word hello. Now, if I say again another keyword, hello world, again it's not coming to a screen. And if I say here, so if you see here, it gets appended. So even though we are saying redirect to a three, once it goes to a file, so everything when it goes to a file, and even though we are pushing in this file here, when it opens everything, when it goes to a file, it's in a append mode. So even though the symbol here is greater than, but it keeps on appending, writing, writing, writing. Now, if I want to turn off this behavior because I have already set up the redirection, so I can do exec three greater than ampersand hyphen. So what it means is whatever redirection is there with respect to file descriptor three, we will cancel that. Now, once I cancel that and if I run this command again, it will give me an error, bad file descriptor. Because this file descriptor is not being redirected. So when I'm writing to three, it's a bad file descriptor. And of course it will not go to a log file whatever was there previously only those contents will be there the new contents hello world will not be typed so to just to make sure it's a new we will just try it like this and see there is no hello world new so this is the way you can redirect any specific file descriptor so you exec three you can have three four five and followed by less than greater than and file name to close that you see exec3 greater than ampersand hyphen so it will close the file descriptor 3 so once you close that if you put a message like this it will not go through it will give a bad file descriptor so we have already seen so the generic form is n less than ampersand hyphen which we have seen like 3 less than ampersand hyphen so instead of 3 it can be 4 5 6 whatever it close the input file descriptor so when it's a less than it's a input when it's greater than it's the output file descriptor so here less than is the input file descriptor now when you say zero with zero is std in and then it's a less than so you can use either this form or this form so by default 
if in less than if you don't give any number in front which is counted as zero so you can either use zero less than ampersand hyphen or you can say less than ampersand hyphen both closes the std in if you say n greater than ampersand hyphen n replaced by some numbers so which means greater than is std out or output file descriptor so you can say 3 greater than ampersand hyphen which closes the particular output file descriptor and here 1 greater than ampersand 1 which means 1 is std out so close the std out when you have a greater than sign and then there is no number by default it takes as 1 now there is another command or you can say concept which is pipes so pipes are used to pass the output of one command to another so what i mean by that is we will look by some example so one of the example we have is ls minus lr so in ls minus lr r means recursively go and fetch all the content so if i run here it will just try to get lot and lots of data for me which would be too much and i would not be able to see so if i want to see one screenshot at a time so i can pass it to another command called pipe and less so this pipe means pass the output of ls minus lr to less command and whatever less does it's up to less whatever way it processes the data here the less command what it does is it prints one page at a time and when i press the space bar it prints another page prints another page then i can see what the data is even though there are a lot of data i will not be able to see all of them but it can process the data at a time so pipe means you output the commands of the output of one command goes to the as an input to another command so this is the first command the output of whatever content shows on the screen goes as an input to less and then there is another command like let's suppose you want to show 10 files into a folder so if you say ls minus lt and then you can say pipe head minus 10 it will say only 10 outputs and this 10 output includes this so this is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and then this one line 10 so which means 10 line needs to be printed and this is just a metadata so you don't this is not the actual file but this is a metadata after metadata it prints out the contents then similarly if i want to in my system to find all the file of type f type f is a regular file and count it so we can do that so i cannot go inside my entire system it will take a lot of time but we can run here so i have some of the files folders and some directory hierarchy there's one directory and some concepts of files so i can say find dot and then i can could say type f i wanted to have type f so minus type f and by default if i do this it will list out all the files and if I pass it to word count, it will tell me word count is a WC. It's a feature. It will say how many lines, characters, and lines, characters, and words are present. So each line is word here. So that's why word and line are same because each line is counted as one. If there would have been some space between these file names, a file name which has some space in between, then it would have counted as two words. But usually i don't create file like that so that's why line word and counts are there if i want to just see the line it will say minus l options which will give you 41 so word count is one of the features through which like whatever the output of the command find is there i am piping it i am giving it to word count so this is another important features which we will be doing and then similarly we can do like we have this etc password so i can just do a word count on etc password so here is another interesting thing let's suppose we say word count for slash etc slash password so it will give me the word count that's good now let's suppose i want to take this to a file so usually what to take this to a file because this is coming to std out so i can say okay file one two three four dot txt and it goes to a file i am not able to see onto a screen but what if i want to see onto the screen and put it to a file so i can pipe to another command called t and t is a special command wherein whatever you pass it to that particular command or i am sorry whatever you pass as the output of that particular command to t 
it will push it to a file as well as show onto the screen now if i say here see you are seeing it on the screen but simultaneously this file one two three four has it also there now if i just put it again maybe another file or maybe in this same file again another time if you see here it's just overriding so there is an append mode also in the t some of the binary you can do that but the bottom line is there is a command called t using which you can show on to the std out as well as pass it to a file you can redirect to a file for reading on later and see so this is useful when suppose you are doing a make and your make takes a lot of project files and it takes some time so sometimes you want to push the output of make onto a screen and at the same time if there is some error message you want to go and refer into a log file so you cannot issue the make file again so what you do is you pipe it to a t make pipe to t and then some log file so what will happen is you can see onto the screen and then if you need to refer back go and look for some syntax error or something you can go and look into the log file so that's the advantage of t so those are the two commands and i will try to cover some of the other concepts like wildcard in our next session so hope to see you soon there thank you very much for watching my video hello friend what's up uh, in this tutorial we will try to look at the concept called wildcard and regex so first we will cover wildcard and in the subsequent chapter and lectures we will try to cover regex so what is a wildcard wildcard are a way in which multiple things can be selected or a rule can be generated in which a shell can expand and select multiple items based on certain characteristics so this might not make much sense to you but let's go through some of the examples and we will see what is it exactly so we will take all our examples with respect to ls because it's one of the most simplest of the commands and the most useful command so let's see if you say ls it will list all the files and folders in that directory without long listing with long listing you have to say l so we will just say ls now let's suppose if it's saying all the files i want to find a file which is of single character name so what you have to say is this one file called one so you there is a question mark question mark denotes one single character so there is if i say ls question mark it gives me just one file there is no other file which is of one character length now if you see here there is this file which is four character five and three eight characters if i want to represent eight characters i have to say eight times one two three four five six seven eight so it matches exact eight characters and see there are some files which are of eight characters this file this file this file and this file so as many question mark is there it matches that many characters now if i say two question mark there is no such file with the name two two letter name if i create a file with a two letter name called as ab and now if i turn this it will tell me ab so question mark denotes one or more character but it has to be at least one when it says one means it has to denote, denote exactly one it cannot be zero now there is a ca character called star so this star represents everything so it could be a zero or more than zero match so what it means is it will match everything so if you say ls star it shows you just everything where it will be useful suppose i want to match a file with extension dot txt so what i could say is okay match anything which is a star and then followed by dot txt so it will list out all the files which are having extension dot txt so this wildcard star will be used in those places wherein you have to match n number of characters this n can be anything and then followed by some more text which you want to find out similarly if i want to find all the pdf i could have said ls star dot pdf it could give me pdf file so we have seen dot we have seen star two wildcard now 
there is a bracket which can also be used for selections and it represents a range so let's suppose I want to find a file which starts with M and inside that the letter could be from A to D and ends it N so the representation bracket will be used for that kind of range representation so the file starts with M ends with N and then it could have any representations from A to D if I run this so I have a file called MBN it starts with N M ends with N and then the letter B falls with between A and D so this is the bracket representations which denotes range you could have also given 0 to 9 and it can tell you the file if it belongs to or if it is there if nothing is there it will not show you anything so 0 to 9 there is one file called 1 if I want to have multiple matches 0 to 9 then I could have given a star and it could have list out like this so all the files which is having some new numeric digits it will list out like this starting with numeric digit if I want to represent files like which starts with text and then there is numeric digits I could have given a star here and then you could have listed all the files which has some kind of numeric digits 0 to 9 inside it so those are the ways we can do then there is a curly brace match the curly brace is like this inside the curly brace you can give some wildcard that wildcard is a star dot doc means search anything which a doc followed by comma and star dot pdf what it effectively means is search for me a doc file and pdf file so there is one doc file and then there is one pdf file if i could have said star.txt it would have matched that as well awesome there is a comma here so it has matched doc file it has matched pdf file and then it has matched the text file now let's suppose if i give something which is not present star.exe so you see whatever matches it will throw on the screen but for something which it doesn't matches it will give me a steady error, error also that cannot access star.exe because there is no such file star.exe now let's suppose I want to do a matching of all the files which does not have 9 so which does not have 9 you match all the files so if you say ls test underscore so i have like test files are there like test one test two test three so many files are there i could have said not conditions which is don't match nine and then you give like this so you see it will tell you all the files which doesn't have nine it has 19 that is okay but it doesn't have nine so it will ignore the line file so if i see everything listing so there is a test nine and then one two three four five so it will show everything but it will ignore the the number nine files which file which file is this test underscore nine see it ignore nine but it is displayed everything so not will be used for ignoring anything so you have to use the right combination of star bracket and things like that now there is this backslash the concept of backslash backslash is used to escape any characters so let's suppose i want to create a file file creation i can do with vi cat or maybe just a touch touch will create an empty file so i would say backslash now if i say backslash it has given me a secondary prompt which is called as ps2 prompt so it is not creating a file it's just giving error missing operand it has not created a backslash file so backslash is not by default not allowed in the file name so if i want to still create a file name with a backslash i have to give one more backslash so the backslash has a special meaning that when you put a backslash it will use as escape characters which means that you use a string literal so one backslash is for escape which means it tells the shell okay i am giving this as a special character by denoting it is a backslash and you use it for whatever reasons now if you see here there's a file backslash getting created similar thing we can want to create backslash dollar and then if you create a file there will be special so that means it's telling a shell okay use this as a literal the other example is let's suppose you want to create a file with a space name suppose hello there this is my file name so 
there is a space here so if you want to create a file like this you could say backslash hello there now if you look here there is a file this hello there so you have to escape special characters so backslash is used for escaping so it tells okay use this space as a literal because i have put it as a backslash and if you want to put backslash itself as a special character then you have to do escape for the backslash so that means it treats backslash as a special character now if you see here there is two file getting generated the reason because you have not done escape so this first escape is for this backslash but then this is space you have not backslash so we will say another escape now if you run here and you will see okay hello backslash space there so backslash is used for escaping any special characters which will not be otherwise interpreted by the shell you can use it to use it as a string literal okay use this as my file name or listing or whatever so that's all for this video and i hope to see you with uh, in the next sessions with respect to regex and we will delve much more details in regex and try to work out on some of the problems and look for grep those kind of commands which supports regular expressions thank you hello and welcome friend in this tutorial we will try to look at some of the find syntax so find command is used for finding any files and folders in some directory hierarchy so it's a very useful command again another useful commands because uh, sometimes if you want to see how old a file is or who has modified a particular file in the last 10 days or maybe in the last 10 hours you can do that so let's start with very basic the basic syntax is find and followed by any path name and when you don't give any other options it will list you all the files and folders present in some particular path so let's suppose if i say dot which is my current working directory it's a special notations for current working directory is dot and dot dot is for previous working directory which is a parent so let's find that so what it will do is it will try to list out all the files and folders in the current directory the current directory is home shakil i could also go to one of the folders which i have created this is called as bssg which is my own folder which i is written for bash shell scripting now if i say find dot here it will give me all those files and folders now if i say the same thing with the path options it would give me the same thing so this is a very simple syntax now suppose instead of finding all files and folders i want to find some particular file with a name abc.txt so i have many files in this folder called bssg which is in my home directory so home shakil and then there is a folder called bssg now if i want to see if i have a file called abc.txt so the command for that is find followed by any path you could have given just dot but let me give a path for some of the examples and then later examples will just leave with a dot or path now if i see here you see it has given me three files one is this home b4 1729 then this file and then this is the third file so it has listed me three files with the name abc i could have given the exact same command with dot because i don't want to search everywhere and it has given me the same thing now if you see here if you give the complete path it will show you the files and folders in the complete path only if you give the relative path which is dot so it will show you from that path only that is the only difference but it, in terms of contents of the find command it will remain the same now this find name will find out all the files with the name abc.txt what if i am not sure whether a was capital or small or maybe b was caps so if you want to find in a case insensitive way you have to say i i means case insensitive so you could have find any file with the letter a small or capital and in any order so any order in a sense in any order of capitalized so if you see here there is this file abc.txt this was not found in the previous 
find because we were just looking with the name now this time we are looking with case insensitive so what it means is that small capital C would also be listed as a file so I'll see this as a case insensitive also by default in find there is this option find dot and you could say print now print is more like a historical thing because the find which we use is from GNU so GNU find by default just prints everything so you don't need to give the print option but earlier command when we used to execute in, in old days of AIX and Solaris you used to give print so but now it's not needed so but I just thought of mentioning now let's suppose I want to find all the files which are of type CPP which means extension dot CPP is there so wildcard is also supported wildcard and regex regular expressions are supported in find command so I could have given star dot CPP so it will find out all the files which are of type CPP so let me show the command again find dot minus I name I'm giving case insensitive anything so most of the time I use minus I name you could use name I name depending upon your habit and choice and what kind of options you use most of the time and within the code you have to see star so anything it starts with anything but it has extension CPP so I have these are files my CPP files now these are files in all the folders and subdirectories and subdirectories it will find out recursively so from BSSG after that B4 virtualizations Zen material Zen store everything it will say like that what if I don't want to descend to this level maybe I want just one level so this is current directory is one level then this another level is a directory called b force and maybe one more level so I want just two level or three level so in that case the option is max depth so I could have said max depth which means don't keep on descending to all the levels you can just descend till two levels and if you see here the files are much lesser because most of the files are in longer directory b force virtualization material zen material and then i have a c file so this is dot is level one level two level three level four so this is four level but here i am saying okay give me just two levels so it will just give me one current directory one cpp file and then inside my test folder there is a hello.cpp so you could specify depth you could say maybe five or three you could go three then you get some more files maybe this one see this is at depth three so first was my current directory that is level one then this b4 directory level two then new idc is my level three so at depth three max to max it can go depth three so it will find the files at depth one depth two and then depth three so this is the way you can say depth now let's suppose I want to find all the files whose name does not have CPP so that means give me all files and folders which are not CPP file so I can give that too so I can say minus not name start on CPP so what I'm saying is find all the files go to max depth of 3 and whose name is not a CPP file so then you see it will give me all the files except CPP in the previous example we were trying to find CPP here we are trying to find CPP but in this example we are saying don't give me CPP everything apart from CPP so if you see here it has given me all the files so this way we can tweak the different options in find and we can get the way we want everything so I hope you enjoyed this video and I will have a um, couple of more videos with respect to find so please go ahead and read all of them thank you for watching this video you have a nice day bye hello and welcome friend in this tutorial we will try to look at some of the more options with respect to find command in the last video we have seen that how to file any particular type of file like let's suppose cpp file so we have already seen that now let's suppose I want to find a file which is CPP and also all the files which are of header type header file dot H so in C 
and C++ you will have the header file dot h and the extension can be cpp so I want to find all files with minus i name and which has the extension star dot cpp in this case i name is not necessary because i name means case insensitive so all the file will have cpp but even if uh, something is like this it will find out so it's not necessary but still i am giving and i name star dot h so what it will do is find all files which uh, have extension dot cpp and minus o means or the file name has dot h extension so minus i name this is minus so you will see it has given me all the files which are of type header file this is my header file dot h or cpp file so it has listed all those files now let's suppose i want to say okay don't go like there are multiple levels one is a current folder then the folder befores then kernel programming and blah 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 i don't want to go till this much level so i could have given the options minus max depth and i could have restricted this to two so i would have said okay just go till two levels and give me all the files and folders so if i go to level two which means just look at the current folder and max to max one more folder under the current folder don't go after that if there is something nested level of directory it will not go till level more than two now if i say level three still i see that there are three cpp files one is cpp one cpp one cpp but there are no header files because till level three there are no header files if i go for depth four i might see some more cpp file and some header file so this is at depth four so this way you can find out so we have seen this minus o option is or similarly we have an option called and and that and is minus a so we could have given that minus i name find all files with cpp and i want my file name to be having the keyword thread so i could have given like star thread star so i in my program there are so many programs which i have written with respect to stack size kernel cpu and everything let's suppose i want to see all the thread programs which i have written which is in cpp files so i would say find dot which is in the current working directory i name case insensitive find all the cpp file and minus a means and the options are star thread so the file name has the keyword thread somewhere now if i see here so i don't see any file with the keyword thread which i have written now let's suppose i want to go in some other folder and try to see that so this is not giving because i have to put it in double quotes now you see here that it has given me the thread function uh, sorry thread file so this is a pthread functions class dot cpp so these are the files it will show it to me so like this now let's suppose i have a requirement that i need to find all the file which has a name abc and it's not a php file so for finding a php file that's very easy i could say star dot php but what i am saying is okay find the file with name has abc so it could be abc star so i could say just abc star and i would say not minus name or i name double quotes star dot php so what it will do is it will give me a file which has a name abc and this is not of type php so this is a not so if you see this has a name abc in the file name this has a name abc in the file name dot txt then this file name abc dot wrap abc dot txt and then this is again abc then this is the assembly so this is the way we can find out now let's suppose by default when i find a file so if you must be aware that in unix everything is a file when we say everything is a file a directory is also a file a file itself is a file so a directory is a file which contains other files and folders 
and directories so folder center trees are same we will use one way or the other but it means the same so a directory is a container which contains files and directories a file is a regular file it has just the content so that's the way so normal file we will distinguish by using the keyword regular regular file when we represent when we say it means a file which has some contents written inside the notepad and that holds that contents in a notepad or a vi and we save it that is a file okay now let's suppose if i say find the file which has a type f when we say f which means it's a regular file so i would say abc and star so what this command will do find in the current directory a file of type f which means find a regular file and whose name has abc it starts with abc and then it has it could have any characters any letters with the star is signifying the wildcard so if you see here i can find this kind of files here abc.txt abc.hla this is my assembly program and those things now let's suppose if we want to find a file with same abc but of type directory if you see here this is a directory i could have seen this directory by ls minus ld it will show me the property of the top level and it says that this is a directory i could also go there just to verify that it is indeed a directory whatever i found here is indeed a directory you see and this is the directory so abc was a directory so to find a file of type directory we will say type d a regular file would be type f okay now if i want to find something in two folders suppose my root so i would say find so first let me not give sudo first say find forward slash i want to find everything in root and at the same time i am giving one folder called shakil and this shakil is mounted in a different partition so it doesn't belong to the root it's not in home root suppose something like that and if i say type f and minus name abc star so what this guy will do is find in root and then home shakil this will be two parts so the first all the examples which we are seeing having one path which is here dot dot means current directory we could have given any path in that but here we are giving two paths so find in this path and find in this path a file of type f and whose name has a letter a b c and then followed by any other letters characters or anything now since i am using a normal user and if i try to find anything in the root i need to have a permission so i will give us sudo word so if i say sudo it will try to find out my it will try to ask me the password and then it will try to find all the files and folders which has the name abc in slash and slash home so it will try to do that now let's suppose if i try to find a hidden file so how will i do that so for hidden files if you know any file with starts with the name the name starts with the letter dot in unix or linux it's a hidden file so usually hidden files are shown by the ls minus la command so you can find with type f suppose you have a hidden file type f which is a regular file and you say minus name dot star so you will find this as a hidden file so if you see here this is a dot directory is a file and then dot cmd and then dot cmd dot cmd so all these are hidden files how is it hidden we can go to one of the folders and verify also and if you see here ls minus l it will show me all these files it doesn't shows me any of those dot a file so ls minus la if i say here you see there is a dot prop dot hello so any file name which starts with dot becomes hidden in linux ls command will not show by default however if you say ls minus la it will show you everything a means show all everything but if you just say ls minus l it will not show so same way you can use the find command 
and then you can say dot star so a file name which starts with dot and after that followed by any number of letters digits so that is become a finding of finding of a hidden files and type f means you find a regular file you could have given directory directory can also be hidden so that way you can use different format of find to do different task thank you all for watching this video and i will have some more videos with respect to find i hope to you will enjoy all this video you have a nice time bye hello and welcome friend in this tutorial we will try to look at some of the other options with respect to find in the past we have seen how to find a file with respect to name or extension now we will try to look for file with some particular permissions now let's suppose we want to find a file which doesn't have all the read write and execute permissions being set now if you are unsure about how to set up permissions i would uh, request you to go and look at the chapter called ch mod and ch own and permissions in my tutorial before you proceed with this permissions thing so let's see in the current working directory i want to find a file of type f which is a regular file as we know from the last tutorial and whose permissions are not 0777 for this tutorial you assume that this zero doesn't exist so it's a read write execute for user group and others now this zero is also needed this zero means a permissions with respect to sticky bit when you are setting up the sticky bit this is with respect to that permission if you don't give so it means just a regular permissions there is no concept of sticky bit in this so this is user group others but when you put 0 or maybe 1, so the sticky bit permission is 1, 0, 2 or 4. So we can either set a sticky bit with this first field or we can set some of the fields like resident set size memory. We can set a program in such a way that if the bit is set, that program will always stay in memory. It will not be swapped out to the disk. Okay so that's a different story but we'll look at the find so what we are saying is find a file which is a regular file which means it's not a directory and the permission is not 777 so we have so many files now if i say okay don't give the permissions 777 what if the permissions actually 777 we have only few files which has a permissions of 777 let's see whatever it has given let's try to verify so that we are sure that we are looking at the right data this will give us a confidence that okay we are running the right command so you see here this is the right command it has all the permissions as we were listing however if you look at this file which was a result of the previous command not 777 so if you look at dot file name it should not have all the permissions if you see here it's not 7 so this is read and write which is 4 plus 2 is 6 and this is 4 4 so this is 6 4 4 not 7 7 7 so that's why it was giving not permissions was output was this so it was giving this when we say permissions 7 7 7 i have only few of this now when you give a permission 7 7 7 which means you're making read write and executable for everyone so you should be knowing what you are doing it might become a security issue if you blindly just give 777 so make sure you understand what you are trying to do so that's a permission now there's a shorthand notations that if i want to find out files which has a sticky bit set so i could say minus perm and forward slash u equals to s what this means is find a file in root directory which is not just my local directory but in the entire root whose permissions user has a sticky bit set slash u stands for user now since i will be running in the forward slash root command so it needs access it will not be it will be denied access to many of the files and folders with lots of errors so i will give a sudo sudo is a special program which makes my program to run as a super user now I'll give a password 
so if you see here some of the programs has the sticky bit set now let's see what is that if i see here ping ping you see here it has a sticky bit set so that's about sticky bits permissions finding the sticky bits permissions now let's suppose i want to find all the files which has a read only permissions for the user i could have given like this find all files which has only read only permissions and if you see here all those files are read only permissions by the way proc file system you have, you might have seen lot of contents with respect to proc proc is a kernel data structure mounted in so that you can look at all the different kinds of variables debug informations devices pids from the kernel it is just a user space mapped as a user space so that a user can access best of course based on some permissions user can access the informations from the linux kernel okay so we were looking at find all files in root which has the permissions for user read only so if you see here just to verify and we can see here ls minus l so you see here it has only a read and write permissions so user has a read permissions others don't have the permissions so slash u means user has a read permissions now if i want to find all files for everyone it should be execute permissions so slash a means all slash u means user so if i say here then you see these files everyone should have a execute permission so let's see this one is l and then if you look here you see everyone has a execute permission so one more thing if there is a directory you should see that if there is a directory and if you say ls minus l on a directory it will actually show the contents ls minus l contents of that directory it will not show you the property of the directory itself so if you say ls minus ld it will show you the property of this directory itself so in the past in previous example when we were saying ls minus l it was actually showing me the contents inside that directory but it will not show about this directory itself so if i use ls minus ld it will show me this directory itself so that's a very important point to note that when you want to look at the property of a directory itself rather than inside the contents then you use ls minus l d now if you see here this property for the read write execute permissions we were trying to look so you see that this is a directory it has a read write execute for the users and for others it's not here so that's what it was saying for slash a for all users it has uh, execute permissions so it will try to find out files like that now if i want to find a file for some particular user like let's suppose there is a user called john and i want to see all the files which belongs to john so what i will give i will give find the path where i want to find out with the u minus username john and it will try to find all the files which belongs to user john so the command is like this i am giving sudo because i might not have the access to run and my command entire under entire slash home so that's the reason i use super user so whenever you don't have an access and if you have the rights for super user try to run it as a super user but always ensure when you are running the command what kind of command you are running whether it's a destructive command that rm or something like that so you have to be very care very careful while executing those commands now let's suppose i want to find a file belonging to user shakil and the name has the extension cpp so i could say find dot or any path name let's suppose that my path is shakil bssg and then i would say minus user shakil and minus i name or name and i could say star dot cpp so now if i give here all these files belongs to shakil and this is a cpp file so this is like this user so whenever you want to find a file belonging to any particular user you would say hyphen user so thank you all for watching this video and i hope to see you in my next video 
you have a nice time bye hello and welcome friends in this tutorial we will try to look at some of the more options with respect to find so let's suppose we want to find a file which have been modified in the last 10 days so the command to do that is find followed by some options with respect to path so we will try to find in the entire root file system the file which were modified in the last 10 days now since i am running it as a user shakil i will have to put a sudo because otherwise it will fail for some of the directories while navigating due to permissions so if you see here all these files was modified in the last 10 days now how do we verify that let's me terminate this because it will take some time to execute this command so i already have some output which i can verify now this is the date and if i look at the date for these files so this was modified on february 16th 1653 and this is february 27th 145 so this was modified in the last 10 days back same thing i can look for some other files maybe i can look for this file this was so this is a directory so i would say ls1 cell this was modified on february 16th today's date is february 27th now if i want to find a file which was accessed in the last 10 days so m time is modified time now access time is a time in the last 10 days i would give forward slash so similarly you can check the timestamp for the file which was accessed in the last 10 days now if you see here for this particular file it still says the date this is the curated or the modified time it is not the access time access time by default you will not be able to see like that you will have to write some of your more commands with respect to access so the system maintains the access time in the file system itself so if you see here this file was created on june modified 29 however this file was accessed in the last 10 days so this access time you can gauge with the option minus a time access time now how if i want to find all files which were modified in the last 10 to 100 days between 10 to 100 days so then we could give in a command like find forward slash minus m time and we will give now plus 10 instead of 10 when we say plus 10 so greater than equals to 10 and minus m time less than 100 so i would give like this if you see here all those files they were of age between 10 to 100 days now find if i want to find the file whose status has been changed maybe 10 minutes back there is an option called c min so c is change of status so we could say like this sudo find forward slash minus c minute and 10 now c is a change change of status and in minutes 10 minutes back file whose status got changed so proc is of course will be changing because it represents the kernel data structure but we will look for file which is present in the disk so this is var log kernel is present on the disk so let's see ls minus l and this file now date is february 27th february 27th 138 148 you see this has been changed exactly 10 minutes back now if i want to see instead of change of status i if i want to see files which were modified maybe 20 minutes back i could have given 20 and less than 20 i could give minus so file which was modified 20 minutes back i could give like this now for access it is a minute so i could give minus 20 minus 60 file which was accessed in the last 20 minutes is a minute so a is for access m is for modified and c is for change of status now let's suppose if i want to find all files in the system which is of size 50 meg i would say sudo find then followed by path 
and then minus size is an option and I could give 50 m so all these files would be of 50 mil so if I see here ls l so you see this is 50 mig so ls minus l will give you in terms of byte and it's hard to read so you could say ls minus l h h is a human readable format and it will tell you the exact size 50 mig this is of size 50 mig now remember this will not be exactly if you take 50 mig so 50 mig is usually like 50 into 1024 into 1024 it will not be exactly this many bytes there might be slightly difference say, with respect to bytes but see if you see here ls minus l so this is 519 and 50 meg is 5242 so the file size is still slightly few keb is less than 50 meg but it will round up and show you files which are around 50 meg so it does a rounding up also there's an algorithm for rounding up how, mu how much it can round so you have to re read the manual of find command or read the info or maybe just read the source code you will see that okay so this is about find file which are of 50 size 50 meg size now what if we say file should be greater than 50 meg and minus size less than 100 meg or maybe 200 meg whatever 100 meg so these are the size of files which are more than 50 meg but less than 100 meg now sometimes we get a query or something like remove all the empty files or find all the empty files or you have a problem in the system and there are a lot of empty files and it will slow down the performance because the file system has to navigate to find certain files it has to look for all the matching files so you can see all these files so these files would be empty files so if i have ls minus l and look at the size if you see the size the file is zero size so to find the empty file you say minus type f which is the regular file and it is empty now the other way to find the empty size is also with the size empty means the size is zero you could also give like this now if you want to find an empty directory instead of file you can say d and you can say empty so these are all empty directories so if you look here actually this is a directory so if you look with ls minus ld it will tell you that this is a directory not a file and then if you go inside this you will see that there is nothing listed ls minus la nothing so this is empty now suppose you want to find a file and do some other kind of operations like your own script running some of your own script so you could say something like find dot minus exec which means execute so find everything which is find dot means find all files and folders then x minus exec means execute ls minus ld and then you have to give a bracket like this brace backslash dot this you have to remember that you have to give like this and this is your command you want to execute so it will tell you so if you see here by default whenever you say find dot it will not tell you the read write permissions and the various fields of the ls way the way ls represents or shows it just tells you the file name so but if you want to see the permissions and everything with respect to ls the way ls shows modified date permissions how many bytes are there date and time stamp so you could run ls minus ld and say minus exec it will show you like this if you want to delete those files you could say rm minus fr but be careful before running this command it will delete the file be careful very very careful don't run that command rm minus fr without knowing what you are doing okay now let's suppose i want to find all the file with the name star.cpp which has extension star.cpp i could say cpp and first run like this so it will display now there is this sarg command what xarg will do is take all the output of the this command and pipe it to xarg xarg will take one argument at a time one file name at a time and it will display ls minus l or any command you can type here 
but i would say ls minus l i don't want to type a rm or something because people might mistakenly run it so that's why i am just running ls minus l so what this command will do is find dot which means find all files and folders in the current directory minus i name which means whose name has star dot cpp which means whose extension has cpp which has any name find all those kind of files and then pipe to xarg and what xarg will do is take like suppose first file name and display ls minus l then it will take second file name display ls minus l third file name displays ls minus l and this is the fixed format which you have to give so this is the way you will run through find so we have find all the files so this way you will run find and see the size permissions the honor modified date and everything whatever so thank you all for watching this video and i hope to see you in my next video you have a nice day bye hello and welcome friend in this tutorial we will try to look at grep command grep stands for global regular expression and printing so this command is one of the most important command um, the reason being you can do any kind of expression search regular expression search for any files and folders so sometimes being a developer or a programmer you need to search for certain codes in certain directories and you might not be aware where exactly those code lies so if you remember some of the keywords like let's suppose there is a wait for single object in windows api so you want to see where exactly that has been used you can say grep minus ri wait for single object and in all the paths you can try to search so it's a very powerful command and particularly helpful for the programmers nevertheless it's also helpful for the system administrator and all kind of folks now grep is useful and at the same time it has lot of variants so it makes it slightly complicated because most of the people they don't understand the difference between egrep fgrep and rgrep so the grep is just a regular grep the first command which i have mentioned and then there are variants for the grep which is egrep which is also equivalent to grep minus e egrep is regular expressions grep it's a extended grep f grep is same as grep minus f it's a fixed string grep fixed string and r grep is for reverse grep it's search in the re reverse order so same thing i have explained in this slide now if you see egrep and f grep they were used earlier as a separate binary but nowadays it's always advisable to use grep minus e for e grep and grep minus f for f grep rather than using a separate binary so that's the right way to use grep so you should use just the grep command and when you want to use extended grep you give pass the option minus e and when you use the fixed string grep you pass the option minus f as in here so this is the right way to use don't use this and this these are deprecated and they are only present for backward compatibility now some of the common grep commands so typically when you want to search something so what you would say is grep the search string depending upon the context which we will cover you can give this in double quotes or you cannot give in double quotes so let's suppose this is just a one fixed string with no space you can omit this double quote but suppose this string has a space or something special which needs to be expanded by the shell it's advisable to give the double quotes and this is the file name or the path where exactly you want to search so this you could have given file1/test.txt here so the syntax is grep then the search pattern and the file where you want to find search now this is just for searching one file suppose you have folders subfolders and you want to search anywhere and you don't know the name of the file so then in that case you give a star star means search everywhere and minus r means 
you do it recursive search in the sense it will descend to a folder then subfolder and subsequent subfolders and it will try to find in all the places so grep minus r so remember this is minus r this is not the reverse r so the other one which we saw here is r grep so this is not the same as r so it's recursive grep so grep minus r shakil and followed by star now let's suppose I want to grab everything except Shakil, which is the reverse operation I want to do. Then it's a V. V means exclude Shakil. So it will show me all the lines not containing Shakil. But there is another option I. I is case insensitive. So it will not show me Shakil or it will not show me maybe S capital and then Shakil or maybe any of these letters in capital letter. Or a mixture of capital and small and it will show me not show me so grep minus r means show me all the files having the string shakil grep minus r v v means exclude show me all the files not having shakil so this is the reverse this and these are the reverse here i have also added i case insensitive operation now in a file if you want to count how many match you have like let's suppose you have taken a pid file in maybe you have run a script and as part of a script you ran ps minus ef got all the pids and you want to know with the same pid how many processes are running with the same pid to know the number of instances of something so in those cases you can do something like grep minus c so you will say the count and what this will do is okay if a process is already running then there is at least one count and then you will not spawn on the process so in those circumstances you will use this so basically count the number of occurrence of the pattern shakil in the file file1.txt now if i want to do extended grep which is e grep or grep minus e which is the right options to pass and you would say okay grep search for the keyword shakil or adel in the file file1.txt so it will find either shakil or adel or both of them occurring in the file file1.txt and this is a regular expression e is for regular expression so thank you all for watching this video and i will go through the practical details of these commands and many other commands in the subsequent video i hope you enjoyed this video and you have a nice day bye hello and welcome friend in this tutorial we will try to look at some of the examples which we have discussed in our last grep tutorial so the general sequence for writing a grep command is like grep followed by any of your search patterns so let's suppose i want to search shakil and a file name so this is a generic syntax so i will try to get shakil wherever is present in the file test.txt so if you see here i have three matching lines and each of the line has a keyword shakil by default it matches the case sensitive way in the sense the case of shakil here and here in the search pattern should match if i want to ignore the case which means i can have a s with a capital or any k or any of the combinations in this capital and small which is case insensitive i have to give the keyword i so now if i run here you see i have some extra contents this ranch belongs to shakil here s is capital this now displays with the minus i option but if we look here it has not displayed that line because it was searching in a case sensitive way so to make it case insensitive it's minus i now if you follow one more thing it tells me which all are the matching patterns in a file it doesn't tells me the file name because by default when you say file name this means these patterns are belonging to this file test.txt however let's suppose if i want to search grep minus i shakil in all files and folders i will have to give the keyword star now when i give the keyword star if you see here when it found some pattern 
it has also given me the corresponding file name the reason for this corresponding file name is if they don't give a file name how do i know this pattern is coming from which file so if it is a multiple files or a wild card it will give you the file name if it is just a single file name it will ignore the file name that is the default behavior of grep because a single file name doesn't make sense because that 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 pattern is found in that file only now if i want to find all files and folders in a recursive way in the sense you descend to a directory and go further into the subdirectory and subdirectory and keep on doing until you have done all the path then you the option is minus r which is recursive option so you search for the keyword so here you search for the keyword shakil in all files and folders you do it in a recursive way and case insensitive so this is the way it works and it will tell you all the file name where it matches along with the path and what is the matching content matching line so this line has the keyword shakil so that's the way it matches now if i want a reverse operation in the sense give me all the contents which doesn't match shakil so i can give v and i can see like this but there are a lot of contents so let they, let me just try this with one file because there there are so many files it's difficult to see go through that so let me do this for one file so now what i'm saying is search for everything in a file test.txt but don't search the keyword shakil so don't give me the pattern shakil but give me everything this is the reverse of what we were doing now so you see here the hi there what's up dude these are the contents it these contents doesn't have shakil so if i look at my file test.txt it has some of the contents so this line doesn't have the keyword shakil this doesn't have shakil this has a shakil so this line would get printed this line would get printed this will not print this will not print then this line would get printed this will not print this will be printed and this will not print so that's the reason we got like this so when we say okay in this file try to search everything which doesn't have shakil so minus v is the reverse of the normal operation of grep there is this utility called as nm now this nm is for looking at the symbols for a particular executable file so i have a executable file a dot out which is just kind of a hello world just prints some statements that's all now if i want to look at all the symbols now what are symbols in executable symbols are those data structures which are part of a function or a variables or a static variables those kind of things those are part of a p file or a executable file which gets loaded at run time so those are symbols there are a lot other uh, def definitions and details about symbols which we will not cover but i just wanted to demonstrate so i am just trying to tell you about symbols so nm will list out all the symbols present in this file a dot out which is a binary file which after running produces this this binary file i just got by having a small cpp file just a small cpp file nothing else hello world cpp file kind of thing now if you see here nm a dot out if i say nm followed by binary name it will list out all the symbols now in this all the symbols there are some symbols which are undefined that means this needs to be fulfilled so either someone has to provide the definition for this or you have to write your own definition for this otherwise this binary will not run so undefined might come at run time from some other dlls but many times your own symbol is undefined and in a executable you want to find out what all the symbols are undefined or how many symbols are present something like that you can do so let me try to do something like this i would like to find all the symbols which are present but ignore anything which is undefined so what i will do is i will say u so nm out will list out all the symbols like this whatever i got 
and then it will say okay grep minus v ignore this kind of sim now so i did a ignore so now you remember you see minus u all the symbols which are undefined or uh, is not present anymore now inside the symbols i don't care about this loading address this is the address relative address where my program would load all these symbols so i want to ignore this so if you see here it is in a in a tabular format so address the type of a symbol and then the actual symbol name so i will i want to extract the actual symbol name so what i will do is i will pass to awk and in the awk i have to give a option or you can just directly print the column third column so let me just print the third column only so i would say print dollar 3 and this will print me all the symbols now in all the symbols what i want to do is some of the symbols might be repeated so what i will do is i will first sort it so it will sort in a default dictionary way so they will sort it and then i will say pipe to unique so it will just list me the unique symbol so these are the symbols present in my system so if i run a command like this i can extract all the symbols present in my executable so this is the kind of useful thing you will do in grep so there are so many usefulness but kind of it will be useful so you can just take out any output do some massaging on that output and run grep and then do some further processing and you make it a uh, some logical conclusion you you can reach to a some logical conclusion or output would be some good thing so these are the kind of examples you will do in real life now let's suppose so i will try i will try to give you one more example with respect to the grep suppose you want to grep for the speed of your ethernet so you need to have a tool called eth tool and to run this tool you need to have a sudo if you don't have eth tool on ubuntu just running eth tool it will tell you the apt get command to install so most probably it will be apt get install or sudo apt get install eth tool so it will give you the options you can search also online or google how to install eth tool and in eth tool you will give your interface name so interface name is your network card interface name network card when it gets detected there is a logical name and that logical name needs to be given by default ubuntu right now it gives ens 33 older systems and saint os and those kind of things they gives e0 some gives e1 also so for ens 33 it will list out the details and i have to give the password because when i am running in a sudo now there is this field called speed so i wanted to get that so i would say pipe to grep speed so now if you see here earlier what we were doing is we used to run the grep command with some such pattern in some file right now this time what i am doing is this is a stream of data this is not file so when you run sudo eth tool it outputs a bunch of data onto a screen so when it outputs a bunch of data onto a screen uh, sorry screen that's a, basically a stream of data that's that's not part of any file so those kind of contents also you can pipe to a grep and grep will try to do some operations based on whatever syntax you have provided whatever options you have provided so here if i just say grep it will tell me the speed now if you see here it has not given me the speed the reason s is capital so what i will do is i will search for minus i which is search in a case insensitive way for the keyword speed in the string this now if i search here it will tell me my ethernet speed is 1000 mb so which is basically gigabit ethernet i have a gigabit ethernet card so each tool is the tool to look for the network informations with respect to physical device information of your network card and how do you get ens 33 that's a simple thing you can run with if config when you run with if config if config will tell you the device name the virtual device name for your ethernet card there are other ways to do that but that's the easy way if you see here eth0 so you run your command against eth0 rather than ens 33 
So these are some of the practical examples of grep. So grep can not only find in a file, but you can pass a stream of data, pipe a stream of data to grep and it can still find out. Thank you all for watching this video and I, I hope to see you in my next video. You have a nice time. Bye. Hello and welcome friend. In the last tutorial, we have looked at some of the grep example. So in this tutorial also, we will try to cover some of the examples. So let me repeat the last tutorial example again. So if I want to search the keyword Shaquille in all the files, I will give like this. And we mentioned that when there are no file name present, like it's a wildcard. So for the users to see clearly which file has the matching pattern, it outputs the file name followed by colon and then your matching content. Now suppose because of any reason you being a user you don't want this file name suppose then the option is H and H will hide the file name from the matching line. Let's suppose you are trying to find the keyword Shaquille, dot, uh, Shaquille in a file called test.txt and whether you give H or not for a single file it doesn't matter so we will not give. So you will see this is a keyword Shaquille A and that also matches because it just match Shaquille. What if I want that it should match exact word not like Shaquille A. So Shaquille A is not an exact match so I want those kind of things. So what I will give is the option W and W will match an exact word. Now if you see here it has not matched Shaquille A, Shaquilla. So how does it consider something as a word what if there is Shaquille followed by some special character so by default the definition of the word is a word is a characters followed by some of the numeric digits so you have to look into the grep man page to get the exact information about what the word is but by default if you can consider from a layman's perspective word is something like considering like uh, letters and digits and some characters some extra characters so now let's suppose if I want to find two strings and either first string is present or second string is present or both of them is present then display me something it's display the search pattern so for that we will use extended grep and we have shown you in the previous slide in the previous video that for extended grep you use an option minus e alternatively you can use mine e grep but e grep is like no, no more used because uh, uh, it's only present for backward compatibility so the right thing is to use minus e option with the grep and let's suppose you want to find the keyword shaquille or azil in a file called file.txt or test.txt so if you see here, it doesn't found anything. Now let me try to find it in file test.txt suppose. So if you see here, it has found this. Now see here, the keyword Shakil is match in this line. Shakil is match. In this line, Adil is match. And here Shakila is matched. So if you want to have either Shakil or Adil or both, you can have this. Let's suppose we.